Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for flowing in to our uh, second days, our second session of our uh, training program. Uh, my name is uh, Kilian Lobato, uh, and I'll be co chairing this session with uh, Guillaume Gaspar, also from the University of Lisbon. Okay, so, for those of you who are not with us yesterday, uh, this is an event organized uh, by several people. Uh, along with me and Guillaume Gaspar, we have Brian Cordell from the University of Texas, we have Carlos Silva from Cité, and we have Paul Freire from the University of Lisbon and also INL. Uh, I will be moderating tomorrow's session on batteries and uh, Brian will be moderating um, Thursday's session on hydrogen. Also, we have our back office people who you can also send messages in the chat. We have Sheila and we have Vera. Right, uh, just a reminder of today's program. So at 10 minutes past the hour, we'll have our first speaker, Saeed Hashmi, uh, and then that'll be followed by a series of speakers, uh, which I'll introduce later on. At the end, we have about 30 minutes for our round table, where any questions which do not go answered during the Q&A session after each talk uh, will be revisited by me and Guilherme and posed uh, towards each speaker and panelist members. So uh, I wish to, hang on, there's a chat here. Okay. So I, I wish to welcome uh, Syed Hashmi. Um, Syed Hashmi is a tenure track assistant professor in printed electronics at, my, at the Microelectronics Research Institute of the University of Oulu, Finland. He has received uh, numerous prestigious funding in capacity of project leader and principal investigator from leading funding organizations, including the Academy of Finland, the Technology Industries of Finland Centennial Foundation, Foundation, and Business Finland. He uh, received his uh, DSC degree in engineering physics from Aalto University, also from Finland, in 2014. Before that, he received his MSc degree in microbiology from the University of Technology. And in 2009, a BSc degree in biomedical engineering from the Sirtai University of Engineering and Technology from Pakistan in 2002. He has authored nearly 30 scientific publications, which have received over 1,000 citations. His research interests include solar cells, printed electronics, energy, har energy harvesting, solar cell, uh, solar fuels, printable batteries, and supercapacitors. The title of uh, science talk today is Carbon-Based Printable Perovskite Solar Cell Technology, an opportunity for low-cost uh, bulk electricity generation. So the floor is your site. I'll stop sharing my screen. And hopefully you'll Thank be you able so much. to, to okay, share let yours. Let me share my screen. Yeah, let me try. Can you all see it now? Yes, yes we can. perfectly. Okay, great. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you so much, Kilian, uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, uh, my name is uh, Gufran Hashmi. And uh, I have uh, since last year joined uh, Faculty of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering at uh, University of Oulu. Before that, I was associated for more than a decade uh, with Aalto University, Finland. And there you can see that I was, uh, you know, gradually uh, increasing, uh, you know, in, 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 in my career. So today uh, I'm going to speak about, uh, you know, one unique opportunity um, for all of us. And uh, in a way, uh, that uh, after my talk, uh, you will realize that, okay, it could be a turning point. So as we all know that, uh, you know, the PV production uh, trends, uh, especially in Europe, has, uh, you know, they are, they are drastically changed. And uh, now the emerging, uh, you know, producer, as we all know, they are now 
you know the mostly the pv production is is happening in china india and also us so when i was uh, either a doctoral researcher or postdoc so the question was uh, that uh, can we bring back the pv factories to europe although there are some kind of activities but as you can see here it's declined like you know drastically so i i believe that eu is in a great need of low cost clean and sustainable energy solution and uh, under this scenario one thing happened as you can see here as a result of my postdoctoral mobility i visited a uh, swiss company called soloronics and on the left side you can see me with dr david martinio and at that time um, uh, i was uh, you know i i remain very lucky to work on a special structure uh, out of variety of uh, perovskite solar cell device designs uh, in this swiss industry and uh, on the right side you can see that uh, after 4 years uh, in alto university before my move to university of oulu me and my dear colleague dr tanya lamen maki um in 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 a project we were able to scale up this technology at all the university and the first uh, you know publication uh, i have provided the link uh, you can all kind of explore it uh and then why it is so interesting it is because as you can see and then maybe if somebody is a solar cell uh, and especially a perovskite solar cell researcher as there would be other people Uh, and other speaker uh, speaking about 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 it so you can see that okay within a decade uh, it's uh, solar to electrical energy conversion at at the scale of like lab size solar cells has drastically improved it it never happened uh, you know to the best of my knowledge like in in, in any other kind of technology and this is like a single junction uh, you know uh, conversion efficiencies however there is also like this tandem structure Uh, with silicon and other technologies like is also like drastically improved uh, so but the thing is uh, of course like you know this is all like you know uh, amazing but uh, mostly uh, all this uh, progress that has that have been made uh, is made on 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 a device structure as you can see here on on my my left side that uh, a very thin uh, kind of you know uh let's say almost a micron uh you know thick stack can be spin coated uh, in 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 a normal chemistry lab uh where by by for by formulating a lot of solutions of individual uh, active layers and then like you know you can also fabricate uh, you can you can deposit through vacuum deposition uh, or like thermal therm thermally evaporated uh, you know metal contacts so all this progress uh, have been like you know done on 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 this uh, traditional classical uh, either it is an ip structure or an inverted structure and of course like you know so optimizing here with with just spin coating is is quite easy although it's not that easy but uh, of course like you you can you can really fabricate nice stacks however uh, you know i remain very lucky uh, after my phd that uh, to work on a special device design uh, that was originally announced by you know the first it was first reported by professor hongwei and lab uh, i think back in 2014 as you can see on the top right structure instead of uh, you know the classical uh, nip structure where you on fto glass you just uh, either first spray pyrolyze the electron transporting layer or even you can uh spin coat like a mesoporous layer and then you infiltrate uh the organic inorganic uh, perovskite uh, precursor solution and then you can also spin coat uh, whole transporting material but uh contrary to this uh, classical structure uh, here uh, on my on my, on my very right up there is a possibility that uh, you know on on a on a glass substrate you can uh, print um and then you can even deposit with the scalable methods like the all the electronic uh, this electron transporting layer such as titanium dioxide and then an insulator and 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 then like a whole collecting layer in in the form of printable carbon and then like from the top you can infiltrate like you know as you can see here a drop 
uh, the perovskite liquid precursor and then like it goes through the pores and then when you heat it up like let's say in between 40 to 60 degree so the the liquid uh, you know crystallizes and then like it, it creates a junction the uniqueness about about this special device design was uh, and is also like the it is like first of all you don't need any any special environment to produce like you produce like in the glove box the traditional device structure or like the very low humidity so it's a completely like clean room free production can be done and also like uh, it's printable and and uh, every layer can be deposited with a scalable technology such as screen printing or uh, spraying or even like the inkjet printing and uh, uh, you know because first of all there is no clean room production is needed and there is no specifically any kind of uh, uh, vacuum based processes uh, involved so that's why like significantly low lower capital investments are 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 needed like to install a factory where you can really scale up like to that size which i showed you in my earlier size uh, in in my, in my earlier slide and one of the outstanding uh, feature about about this special device design is that it's promising stability as we all know that the perovskite uh, sensitizer itself like it's very very sensitive to the moisture and humidity but uh, because like uh, at the outermost layer it is a carbon carbon offer like some kind of natural hydrophobic effect so even if you leave it like uh, you know open air so then like the the performance doesn't deviate and it shows like very promising stability so that motivated like you know me and then i started working on this device design and this is like the first outcome where you can see all the fabrication process i'm not going, going to into the detail but however like i would say that why this was like interesting because all this scalable processes as i mentioned like you can produce like the compact layer with this scalable uh, spray pyrolysis or like the silver contacts or even mesoporous layers of uh, electron transport and also like the insulator and carbon however like as i mentioned that in the last step like it was like manually uh, you know uh, the perovskite ink was man manually infiltrated so that was kind of you know creating some kind of uh, problem because in all this nanotechnology based kind of you know stacks the reliable process control is is is, is a very important work that you need to achieve like the reproducibility uh, at the nano 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 level so that motivated uh, us because like it utilizes a special precursor ink of perovskite that remained like very very stable and uh, with the with the with the crystal growth uh, growth inhibitor it is called 5 avai uh, so you know it, it typically doesn't like you know uh, uh, crystallizes if you take it off like the ink like from the hot plate Whereas like in the typical, typical uh, classical device design, you, you keep like the, the solution on the hot plate and then you quickly like take it out and then you drop it before spin coating. However, this, uh, the sensor, uh, this, this perovskite precursor ink was so stable. So that caught up my eye and uh, why it was so interesting for me uh, because with my colleagues, we had previously uh, published like two interesting studies like for the dye sensitized solar cell technology where we demonstrated with the inkjet printing process the you know like the electrolyte and also like the dyes like you know which was like a very different way and now it's possible that you can uh, you know bring like multiple dyes whereas like you typically dip uh, for the dssc photo electrode and then you only can stain with one one sensitizer so th this this had given us like you know very good confidence so when we, and when we had a good kind of you know understanding about the stability of the uh, materials the and compatibility with this inkjet so that's why we tested and kind of you know we were very very positive and you can see here like when you print it on the on the on the commonly available xerox paper so this is like uh, in, in, in the middle, you can see that a QR code of all the university at that time when we went. And most importantly, when we infiltrated like, you know, this, so we were able to tune very nicely, both like the current densities and like the efficiency and the reproducibility in the devices like uh, was, was, was amazing. So this was like one of the first, because even like in this spin code base, like, you know, uh, counts or like the batch, like which, which researchers are, are presenting. So it's, it's, it's a count like where, of course, like one or two cells like overshoots, but this is not acceptable 
when you are trying to scale up like a technology because if you produce a batch of modules so they should be kind of you know giving like reproducible performance and most importantly at that time like it is few years back like when everybody was trying to get some stable results so this is one of the promising feature of, of, of this device structure that when after infiltrating and testing with initial performance so when we soaked like under full sun and, and some kind of temperature so then the devices showed a very good kind of you know promising stability although the efficiency in this device structure was like uh, very very low because uh, it's very thick uh, uh, you know device structure compared to the traditional classical one it's almost like 14 to 15 micron i will i will i will explain in the next upcoming slides so that got our attention and then then we filed also a patent application and maybe i'm very positive that in this month or maybe i don't know we are about to hear a good news about 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 this uh, application so the first results uh, um, were very promising and that motivated like you know me to test uh, you know uh, this special device design under various uh, you know uh, simulated environment so we had an opportunity we had a very good uh, you know uh, uh, um, a testing chamber where we set up a uh, 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 one more environment and with very heavy UV plus like some kind of um, uh, temperature, we try to investigate again like without encapsulating the device. So here you can see that uh, until 200 hours, the devices shows like a very uh, good, uh, you know, performance. However, after that, it started like declining, but even like continuous 200 hours, like were a great kind of, you know, promising results and even without kind of you know encapsulation so then you can see this lead appeared like at the corner that is a, that is a sign of like degradation so what we did we simply uh, you know uh, squeeze like that commonly available epoxy and then we re-soak like into the into the same chamber and that greatly retarded uh, you know like the rate of degradation although like some sign of degradation appeared but not that much like that were appeared so what happened again like with this kind of a standard 1000 hours of length of continuous like stability testing and meanwhile the devices were tested like you know um, you know periodically but like it passed like you know and also like again like that we were not concentrating on on efficiency but we were mostly kind of, you know at that time like you know the, the stability was a, was a great great issue so these two promising results like uh, you know went to very good 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 journals and again like we had an opportunity then because uh, it was said that the the, the perovskite cells cannot survive like uh, in this humidity and or the humid conditions uh, so the curiosity again led that uh, if we soak the devices so what happened like you know i was expecting uh, a very very rapid degradation but surprisingly, what happened that when we soaked the devices in a in a humidity chamber and then like where we kept like the humidity 65% plus minus and then combined with a, with a thermal uh, mild thermal soaking like it's 40 degree. So it creates a steamy environment. So as you can see here, the device that shows like, you know, very high stresses in the beginning. So when we soaked it like so surprisingly and shockingly, I would say that it, it, it drastically uh, you know the performance not only improved but like the hysteresis was almost like vanished and if you can see like it's this device which is soaked for almost like 200 hours and only marginal sign of degradation were appeared at the corner and like within the pores you can't see and then like and you can see for the first time we observed a drastic decrement in the overall cell resistance whereas in our previous two results like this resistance and is both like the efficiencies remain like very st kind of stable but here, like you can see, a lot of drastic uh, changes occurred uh, in, in various parameters. So uh, VOC and GSC were not that much improved. However, the fill factor and efficiency and then cell resistance were, was drastically, these parameters were drastically like changed. So that le led that, okay, what happened? So in the curiosity, uh, you know, first, like, you know, we, uh, and I, I, I tested the device with very slow scan rate for 10 times that okay to, to ensure that okay these changes are permanent or not and as you can see here like you know so the devices did not degrade at all because 
it also happens in the traditional device design that okay one is scan you are getting like some good results but like you know if you do the multi-scanning it it goes down so that's why kind of and then you can see here uh, almost 50 percent the performance like even if you take from the forward and reverse scan and then average so then it was 9.2 but it was almost 50 percent increment and then we also did some ftir uh, kind of you know test to check that if there is some kind of you know changes occurred in the in, in in the structure but it was it was almost the same so then like that led to the curiosity that what is happening like in the structure and then we found that okay a surprising perovskite crystal growth so it was not possible to see through the pores but as you can see if you remember like my previous slide some sensitizer came out like you know and so from the corner like we started like imaging over the different period of time and here you can see that in the beginning it was like kind of like the when they, they, it crystallizes so then they, they remain small chunks but over the period of time like they start fusing together and then they were converting into like this kind of like big crystals and this uh, you know on my left side if you see the xrd uh, you know spectra so then this 14.1 degree peak we all know now like it, it belongs to perovskite crystal uh you know and 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 over the period of time this this peak elongated that 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 confirms and then also like uh, we also did some very simple uh four probe measurements like you know the sheet resistance test and with a blank uh, or like you know even if you don't uh, infiltrate so the sheet resistance of the carbon electrode remains like around 14 to 15 ohms square um uh ohms per square and then like you know when you infiltrate the ink and then you crystallize it so then it decreases down obviously because like this crystals makes interparticle connection however after the hte treatment and as a as a as a as a result of crystal growth it was further improved and that's why like the sheet resistance were for, uh, further like decreased down and that's why the we, we we believe that okay this like as a result of this crystal growth it improves the interface so there are like other uh, people I and mean, the researchers have reported other techniques in the traditional device design where, for example, here in this case, like, you know, some template, this polymer, uh, you know, were used with different concentration in the ink of perovskite in order to achieve uh, large grains. And that is a sign again, like, so it is, it is, it is again an, an evidence. But that that time, like nobody believed that okay, under the high humidity, the, you can achieve like or you can grow crystals. And what happened that after like you know, uh, when we soak the devices again, like for a humidity, uh, not humidity, but a full sunlight light soaking test at maybe forty degree to us, you can see from the link like the the details of the of that study. So this again like remained like stable, and that that created like a lot of excitement that okay, for the first time. Uh, you know there is a possibility to do a lot of things and then like you know unfortunately like and i if some perovskite solar cell researchers are, are listening so i would i would i would appreciate them that okay i would motivate them to always uh, also uh, you know uh, major the cell resistance you can you can do it like with the from the slope of the jv curve and then kind of you know because it is like overlooked and for example in our device structure which is 10 to 15 times thicker so you can see that okay like this is one of the critical parameter without going into the deeper in the science so you first thing you need to decrease down like the cell resistance and as a result of this crystal growth this 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 was possible so that 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 made a lot of excitement and then like we contacted uh, the local uh, funding agencies and then business finland listened to us and then we were awarded like a project called printed parotech uh to see the possibility of the commercialization so with the local uh, you know glass industries who are producing in finland um uh you know very very uh, interesting uh, building components so we try to explore like the potential so although i'm, I'm showing you only like this kind of uh, technical development so we further scaled up the technology and then we tested a lot and as one of the example is that you can see here uh i think the active area was more than 236 square centimeter and then there was a very uh, you know good efficiency uh, you know were achieved uh, and then like you know you can get very good open circuit voltage and this is a serially connected monolithic style so that's why the voltage adds up but the current almost remains the same so it it, it really like you know and then like if like a few people can scale up and in a complete clean room free environment so that is an opportunity for almost every European country to rethink that, okay, 
can we install like you know some low cost factories and then after uh, concluding that project so then again uh, one more funding were, was awarded and a lot of things happened at that time that i also got uh, uh, an opportunity uh, to to join like uh, university of olu as a faculty member so this project although it was awarded like at alto university but then it was moved and then since uh, last year i started like with and then hired two doctoral student so you can all see uh, a kind of introductory um, you know a clip about about this new lab where like uh, i'm i'm again coming back on on the driving seat and trying to build up like where we left in our previous project and now these two young students uh, are getting trained under my supervision and uh, these are all these kind of uh, new efforts at my new place uh, under this very special time uh, so meanwhile we are collecting some kind of you know interesting you know experimental data so i'm trying to you know remain connected like you know with the ongoing development worldwide and some kind of uh, clips also surface so then you can also like uh, see and then also in this ule news uh, ule tv a documentary was also you know filmed uh to, to to highlight like what has happened like in finland in this kind of technological development of, of perovskite perovskite solar cells so i i will conclude that kind of i'm, I'm very grateful for all my colleagues uh, who were a part of, of this journey and now with these two new members like we are trying to push again like what what best we can do so i'm i'm very grateful to all the financiers Uh, who who believed in me and my ideas and then like kept funding me to date and i thank you all of you with that and i'm open up for the question thank you thank you gofran thank you for that uh, excellent and interesting talk it's good to see you talking finally um, i know we've collaborated at in yes. some projects in the past but not not directly Yes. Uh, you can see some photographs of some people I know as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Right. Um I think I think I we have a few questions uh, related to we don't have much time. So uh, a few questions relating to scale up. Uh I think uh maybe what people would like to know is um what what differences did you observe in the devices when you scaled up? I uh, yeah uh, yeah and so the also the second also um what things do you have to think about when you're scaling up okay so sure. what are the difficulties encountered in the actual manufacturing uh the thing is uh, the only thing is actually because all these technologies are like you know getting developed and according to the need you know like for example in the business finland project uh, you know what i was believing that proving the technology on just 10 by 10 a square centimeter piece of glass i would be the winner but however after executing the technology uh, or the executing the project what i came to know that uh, scaling up the glass <coughs> is not a problem but like you know there is no uh, for example a special ink jet uh, you know are available so because you know you can scale up the glass like one or four square meter even but how would you you know you know print all the layers like or even there are screen printers available but there are again like some systems are needed like to specially design and also like kind of you know the if you scale up so and if you go with screen printing kind of you know technology so though at, at low level you okay like you can handle the screens and then all these kind of solvents and then cleaning up and but if you are really like you know uh, thinking about the module production so these kind of you know challenges uh, you know remain but the good news is that uh, for example when we were moving like let's say from 10 by 10 to 20 by 20 so on the active area i did not see much difference in the power conversion but like when we fabricate this within like by the very last moment of of concluding this business finance project on 40 by 40 at that time we do not had like a larger solar simulator and also like this major measuring like these uh, these devices like even if you are measuring as 
you know, a solar panel of, of perovskite technology. So you cannot measure it like you measure like the traditional silicon panels. So all these kind of, uh, you know, uh, challenges like, you know, we observed. Okay. All right, good friend. Uh, my apologies for getting your first name mixed up. Sorry about that. Um, I hope I've corrected that now. All right, uh, to, we'll stick to the timetable. So I'm going to thank you, but we'll, we have plenty of questions that we can that can be asked at the sure. end in the round table. Okay, good friend. Thank you very sure. much. Thank you. Thank you. I will stop now sharing. Okay. So our next speaker is a Gurleen Kaur. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Photovoltaics de Ile de France in Paris. She's developing novel materials for affordable solar cells. Uh, she's an engineer trained in liberal arts and is passionate about using technology to create impact for sustainable solutions for, future, for the future. Her goal is to take affordable and clean energy solutions to the doorstep of every individual on our planet. Uh, she has been named as the female science talent of 2021, a future leader, energy leader 2019, 11 in the world by the BP uh, PLC, and a BP scholar in 2019, and one young, uh, one young world ambassador of 2019, along with the youngest international energy agency delegate in 2017, and also an emerging leader, young leader in Asia 2015, and Young India Fellow 2015, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, a very promising career. Uh, her talk today is on charge-based carrier selective passivated contacts for silicon solar cells. So, Gurleen, the floor is yours. Okay. Oh, first of all, a very warm welcome to all of you across the globe and today on day two of Net Zero Climate Emissions Program. Um, I will be giving a talk on charge-based carrier selective passivated contacts for silicon and solar cells. Um, firstly, uh, my apologies for the technical difficulties. We did a background check day before yesterday, but uh, still what happens, happens beyond our control, digital age. Okay, so uh, about the topic, uh, I explored this area during my PhD and found very interesting insights, which I will share with all of you today. So after attending this talk, a short talk, basically you will be able to not only understand carrier selective passivated contacts, but also design them um, by yourself. Um, first, a bit about my background. Um, I was born and brought up in India, and I have the honor of being the first engineer in my entire family. Uh, in fact, extended family and being a girl really helped my peers following uh, onto this path later. Um, I did my PhD from National University of Singapore and uh, I am currently a postdoctoral researcher at Institute of Photovoltaics, Ile de France. Uh, before this, I was also working at Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore. So I had the chance of being in research environment, one of the best research environments across Europe and Asia. Um, then, um, so going back to the talk. So this talk is organized into the following sections, uh, introduction, experimental details, simulations, followed by results and conclusion uh, with regards to the different passivated contacts and their carrier selective nature. So, um, as we all know, the future of energy depends upon three factors in energy market trilemma, which are energy security, environment sustainability, and energy affordability under uh, sustainable development goals by UN. Solar energy intrinsically satisfies the condition of energy security and environment sustainability. However, affordability yet remains a concern. The key to improve the affordability of solar energy is to effectively harness the power of solar cells and bring down the cost of per unit energy. And 
solar cell efficiency is one of the key factors in bringing down this technology cost. Um, yes, according to the latest ITRPV reports, uh, PERC or TopCon technology, PERC is passivated emitter rear contacts and TopCon is tunnel oxide passivated contact technology, had more than 65% share in the market in 2019. And as per their forecast, this share is only going to increase to 80% in the coming decade, which makes the passivated contacts taking more and more uh, market share in the coming years. This not only shows the industrial faith in the robustness of the technology, but also um, its cost effectiveness. And uh, if you look at the market production data, this passivated contact technology might even be able to bridge the gap between uh, heterojunction technology and monopassivated silicon contacts. So this has a way to go forward. This technology is not only industrial, low cost, but also becoming more and more efficient with uh, new upgrades in the market. So, Yes, it is worthy of putting our weight behind it if we want to green the planet with uh, new ways uh, of energy generation. So, so the idea here again is to improve the efficiency in solar cell. And as I mentioned, this improvement in cell efficiency is one of the key factors to bring down the production cost technology. So, let us look at the problems that limit this uh, improvement potential in solar cells. So uh, this thing is divided into uh, four parts. We look at the problem, we we'll develop a hypothesis, then we look up at uh, an approach to solve it, and then we look at some results. So first we're looking at the passivated contact technology. So it is well known that the main sources of solar, main sources of losses, in a solar cell are due to recombination, which comprise more than 40% of the total losses in the solar cells. So the recombination can be junk junction recombination, metal recombination, emitter recombination, bulk recombination, so on and so forth. So therefore, in order to improve the efficiency, we need to decrease these recombination losses. And the passivated contact technology just can do that. For instance, in a perk cell, which is almost 55% of the losses due to the rear side contact are due to the rear side contact. And when we replace it with a monopoly cell, uh, which is a version of a passivated contact, these recombination losses are decreased to only 15%. So now, let us understand how this passivated contact technology work. So in a passivated contact, uh, we have a tunnel junction. We have a tunnel junction and a capping uh, layer on top of it. So in a conventional contact, the dopamine diffuse defects leads to recombination. So the tunnel junction uh, passivates these defects which provides, which increases the current that can flow through the contact. And at the same time, a capping layer, um, which can be a highly doped or a wide band gap or a high low function work function material ensures selectivity. Yes. So as I talked about surface passivation uh, before, so surface passivation is the reduction of loss of charge carriers due to the recombination at the surface. And it is divided into two kinds of passivation techniques. One, which is the field effect passivation, which means that you electrostatically shield one type of charge carriers. And this is responsible for the fixed charge within the dielectric layers. And the second kind of the pa uh, passivation scheme is the chemical passivation, where you actually reduce the density of the interface states, which means you passivate the dangling bonds that are aware at the interface of crystalline silicon and layer that you're going to put on top. 
Um, further, uh, in order to look at the carrier selectivity of the contact. So as we know, uh, the process of carrier, uh, charge carrier selectivity at the metallic terminals here implies an asymmetric flow of charge carriers towards the solar cell regions. That is, um, a strong uh, electric current is governed both from conductivity due to flow of electrons and due to flow of holes. And we know that we can write this current, uh, current density in, as the following equation. So if we uh, look here, uh, we have flow of electrons and flow of holes. And in let's say we have an electron selective layer here. So in electron selective layer, majority carriers would be electrons and minority carriers would be holes. So minority carriers uh, would be uh, responsible for, for the, the contact recombination, which are the non-collected charge carriers to contact Re, uh, contact resulting in recombination and the majority carrier qu quantity, which will be responsible for the interface resistance to the collected charges uh, derived uh, in this case. So a J electron, which is the majority carrier quantity responsible for getting resistivity is responsible for selectivity and J holes, which is a minority carrier quantity is responsible for getting us the recombination current density. And this is also responsible for passivation. Um, so we know that higher the selectivity, higher is the efficiency of uh, solar cells. And it is very important to know that we have conductivity here and conduct. And if we look at conductivity is dependent upon both carrier concentration and carrier mobility. So uh, sigma is equal to E n mu, and therefore it can be manipulated via doping or uh, allowing band bending or by using novel materials with tunable work functions or band offsets. So this is by using these three uh, variations of the materials that you are going to put on the uh, in between the metal contact and silicon, you can uh, improve the carrier selectivity of the contact. Um, so now the idea is, let's say if you want to enhance the electron or hole selectivity further. So as we know, um, in the current carrier selective passivated contacts or a normal top con contact, uh, we use silicon oxide, which is a neutral charge layer and we use N plus polysilicon. So now the idea that we are trying to employ here is we put a tunnel layer, which has high intrinsic fixed positive charge inside it. And this intrinsic positive charge uh, prevents the recombination of electron and hole pairs. So which means it provides more surface passivation at the interface and also uh, decreases the defect density. So, which means we have higher row contact and we have lower uh, contact resistivity and we also have lower uh, contact recombination density. And we know that both the product of both of these is responsible for getting us the selectivity and even uh, cell efficiency. So higher the selectivity, higher is the cell efficiency. Similarly, for enhancing the whole selectivity, uh, we can say that we produce, we put a negative charge layer. So a negative, so here in this case, putting a negative charge layer will repel the electrons from this side. So the recombination of holes and electrons would be lower, and lower uh, recombination current density of electrons in this case will give us lower J contact, and. Here, we have lower resistance to the flow of electrons due to the band bending here. So alox polysilicon in this case will, uh, is also a good potential material that we will go through. So now we, we are at the point, at the moment, the hypothesis is that 
interface charge can improve selectivity or not, but we need to test this hypothesis, if it actually works or not. So in order to do that, we first uh, take ultra thin tunnel layers, we develop charge inside it, then we integrate them with suitable capping layer, and then we check the efficiency potential. So we use that for a different number of layers. So there are uh, further details uh, in, into all of these things. So for instance, um, as I mentioned, we screen reference silicon oxide tunnel layers along with LPCVD silicon nitride uh, or ALD aluminum oxide layers with high positive or negative charge. And then we check the impact of surface pretreatment, which means that it can have an H-terminated surface or an OH-terminated surface. Then we look at the influence of tunnel layer thickness. So we know that if the interface layer or the layer that we're going to put between the capping layer and the crystalline silicon is thick, they, the current will not pass through it. So we have to ensure that the thickness is almost uh, in the tunneling regime, which is uh, less than 1.5 nanometer. And the third is uh, we are trying to uh, check whether how much, what is the quantity of charge or what is the effect of charge formation that happens with regards to annealing. So we look at the temperature of annealing, we look at the ambient in which the layer is annealed before we finally make contacts uh, with these uh, materials. So uh, if we look at the basic uh, results here, so wet silicon oxide has very low char fixed charge uh, without annealing, which is around uh, in the range of 10 to the power 10. And it can be used as both electron selective contact or whole selective contact as per literature. Aluminum oxide, on the other, ha other hand, has high negative fixed charge density. Therefore, the possibility of using it as a whole selective contact. Then silicon nitride as a positive, uh, high positive charge layer. So the possibility is to use it as an electron um, selective contact. So yes, so now the next step would be to put it with a suitable capping layer. So as per literature, a lot of people put conventionally doped polysilicon. It is a expensive, high temperature and a process which uses toxic plasma gases. So therefore we experimented with organic materials. So specifically we used novel P.PSS um, capping layer, which was a low cost, low temperature contact and it provides an organic alternative to polysilicon um, uh, material. So the next step after screening the tunnel layer would be we put a capping layer on top of these materials and then we measure the J0 contact, which is the contact recombination density and the contact resistivity as uh, mentioned previously. And finally, and we do this measurement uh, by TLM uh, method. And finally, we check the efficiency potential of the tunnel layer passivated contact. So, so basically the efficiency potential uh, values, we calculate using Brendel's model, where we firstly presume a perfect front side contact, which means this contact has no recombination uh, problems and does not provide resistivity to the tunnel layer or the capping layer that we are putting at the rear side. And then, uh, and we get a plot like this, uh, where, which is a product of J0 contact and a low a row contact. And we are able to find the efficiency values. Uh, and these blue lines uh, indicate selectivity according to the formula discussed before. And the second uh, case here is the realistic efficiency potential, where from literature we have taken the front side values of the contact and then we simulate the values using the measured uh, rear side contacts. So these, uh, for instance, in this case, uh, the black dots represent the measured values on this. So this, this dot can really tell us how much would be the efficiency of the actual cell made uh, in this case. 
and these blue lines are the selectivity lines. So yeah, so finally we look at the results. Um, yeah, so this was the overall process or the flow of experiments. Uh, in the interest of time, I've skipped some details. I would be happy to discuss more uh, if you have questions in the Q&A section. So we'll first look at the electron selective contacts of silicon oxide and silicon nitride. Uh, and similar processes have been used to develop aluminum oxide uh, hole selective contacts as well. So yes, so firstly, normally people use silicon oxide, which is deposited by uh, either wet chemical deposition or deposited uh, thermally. But here, what we are screening here is we systematically screen the annealing temperature of the wet chemically deposited uh, silicon oxide and check what is the improvement in lifetime. So here, as we see, as we increase the annealing temperature, we see an increase uh, in the lifetime. And then we measured fixed charge density um, in these layers, which were almost 1.5 nanometer thick. And to our surprise, when we annealed the samples at 900 degrees Celsius, we had fixed charge density as high as 2.5 uh, into 10 to the power 12 uh, centimeter per centimeter square. This is a very high fixed charge density in the layers, though. Here, the higher fixed charge density is also compensated by the higher defect density in terms of uh, trade-off between the field effect passivation and the chemical passivation, as I mentioned before. But this is a very good uh, starting point for us to evaluate whether positive charges can improve the, uh, the carrier selectivity. Um, and uh, we know that this formation of fixed charge upon annealing is due to a high temperature. And at high temperature, uh, we have rearrangement of oxygen atoms. And this allows the form, this makes the formation of charge within the silicon oxide layers. We also see quite high uh, implied VOC results at the least temperature. Um, further, when we made passivated contacts out of this, uh, we see that upon annealing temperature, we see lower J contact values um, upon annealing, uh, un increasing the annealing temperature, which is a good result. And again, this can be attributed to the formation of charge upon annealing. Um, but uh, we can see that though the thickness of silicon oxide layer increases uh, upon annealing temperature, but we still get our uh, resistivity minima at 900 degrees Celsius. So this could be formation due to the formation of pinholes. And we can say that the charge transport in a passivated contact can be written as a product of uh, current flowing through it because of tunneling and current flowing through it through pinholes. Uh, further, uh, on the efficiency potential calculation, we can see that our, uh, for the contact annealed at 900 degrees Celsius, the efficiency potential as high as 27.65% can, can be achieved, whereas our reference is only around 26% uh, 26 uh, in this case. So an improvement of over 1.2% one, uh, 1 here. Uh, further, um, so we first screen silicon oxide. Now we are looking at silicon nitride layer. And again, um, as expected, upon increasing temperature, we see an improvement in lifetime. Uh, this improvement in lifetime here correspondingly is again attributed to the formation of charge. Uh, with charge, we also see an increase in defect density. And FTIR uh, results indicate uh, increase in silicon oxide peaks, which are related to the formation of fixed charge, resulting in charge trapping mechanism, and increase in silicon-silicon peak, so what happens uh, is that when you are annealing silicon nitride layer at high temperature, um, 
NH bond breaks. So there is a fusion out of hydrogen and silicon, silicon peaks are formed, which means a fusion of hydrogen resides in a decrease, uh, resides in increasing of defect density, which is uh, similarly observed at higher temperature. Um, and again, we see a higher implied uh, VOC at higher temperature. Uh, further, we did another interesting thing. We took, we varied the surface termination in this case, where H terminated surfaces uh, were the HF dipped surface, and OH terminated surfaces were where we intentionally grew, uh, we intentionally uh, grew oxide before depositing silicon nitride. So as we can see, if we have an OH terminated surface, uh, we result in better fixed charge, better lifetime, um, better implied VOC as well. So it is important or it is uh, good for the passivated contacts if we do OH terminated uh, samples. Uh, further, we varied the annealing ambient uh, and Instead of annealing in air ambient, we annealed in forming gas ambient. So as we, and we again had both H terminated samples and OH terminated samples. So we, uh, in this case, we had, uh, we can see that air terminated samples or air annealed samples show higher uh, lifetime and implied VOC than forming gas annealed samples. But when we, put these samples under microscope, microscope, we saw that air annealed samples were quite thick. And as I mentioned, that thickness is an important attribute for us because we need our tunnel layers to be thin enough so that the current can tunnel through these layers. So the next question for us was, though we have higher lifetime here, this results in a forming gas anneal results in lower thickness, but then does the thickness actually helps us or are the thinner tunnel layer beneficial for passivated contacts? So in order to check that we made contacts and we measured the recombination current density and we found out that air anneal uh, samples resulted in lower recombination current density and again, which terminated samples resulted in lowest uh, uh, contact recombination density. So this is as low as 5.17 femtoM. Then for contact resistivity, we also uh, we saw that H terminated samples show lower contact resistivity than OH terminated samples. But then again, air ambient samples also showed a uh, lower uh, resistivity than forming gas annealed samples. Um, yeah, despite having thicker uh, tunnel layers in between. So we, we think that this is uh, because of the formation of pinholes, um, which again, as mentioned earlier, the passivated contact, the current flowing in a passivated contact uh, will have pinholes and uh, will have uh, tunneling current because of the polysilicon layer that we are depositing on top of it. And when we look at the efficiency potential curve, we see a quite an improvement from the reference silicon oxide N plus polysilicon contact, which is around 26.8% to 28.3% uh, in an air annealed sample, which has high positive fixed charge density. So this is almost a 1.3% increase compared to our reference. Um, so till now we talked about electron selective contacts. Uh, I will quickly take you through the whole selective contacts uh, where the tunnel layer is aluminum oxide, which is high negative fixed charge density. And the capping layer here is um, P plus polysilicon, not N plus polysilicon, P, P plus polysilicon or a P dot TSS. So a P dot TSS is considered to be a P type semiconductor, has a behavior of a P type semiconductor. Um, therefore, uh, we, we used it and on top of it, it was organic and low cost material. 
So we screened the aluminum oxide tunnel layer. We studied various cycles from one to 15 cycles, where one cycle is around 0 0.13 nanometer. So we almost studied from 0.3 nanometer to two nanometer thick aluminum oxide on different terminations. So firstly, as we see for both H and OH terminations, as we increase the thickness of cycles, uh, we see an increase uh, in the lifetime. And this, uh, this effect is more prominent when we have annealed samples. Uh, specifically above seven cycles. And this is because uh, uh, for thicknesses greater than seven cycles, we see a prominent formation of fixed charge density. Um, and seven cycles corresponding to, corresponds to around one nanometer. And we know that uh, charge in aluminum oxide forms uh, around one nanometer away from the interface. So all of these uh, all of these results are in cohesion with what is already available in literature. And we see also a low, lowering uh, defect density due to thicker interfacial silicon oxide in OH terminated samples also. Colleen, um, yes. could I ask you just to, to wrap up, please? Yeah. Just that we're already 15 minutes late. Sure. So, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Thanks. Yeah, it's okay. So basically, yeah, so with, with the surface treatments, uh, we, we see that with OH terminated samples, we have an intentionally grown interfacial oxide, which is thicker than the ones in H terminated samples. And this is confirmed by FDIR. And, uh, and again, if we look at the efficiency potential curve, we see that higher in case of P.TSS samples, a uh, higher fixed charge at the interface improves selectivity. So this is the reference. This is uh, the fixed charge uh, above uh, 1.5 nanometer. And lower J0 contacts promote high efficiency, whereas the case is not same in case of a high temperature boron dope system. This is because of dope and diffusion at high temperature uh, that uh, happens due to a charge comp compensation mechanism of boron. You can read more about this in the references below. And overall, does the interface charge improve carrier selectivity? The answer would be yes. A big yes for electron selective contacts. And for hole selective contacts, you have to tune the temperature. So um, the conclusions of the presentation are on the screen. We screened silicon oxide, silicon nitride, and aluminum oxide dielectric layers. Uh, with increase in fixed charge density, we saw uh, higher efficiencies uh, compared to the reference. And we saw that aluminum oxide P.TSS whole selective contacts have uh, efficiencies above 26%. Interface uh, layer is critical. And high temperature anneal leads to improvement in fixed charge and pass improved passivation quality. And again, um, air anneal and forming gas anneal makes a lot of difference. And so does the termination of different uh, samples, whether it is H termination or OH termination. But overall, there is a trade-off that you're going to achieve between the tunnel layer thickness and the passivation quality. So I would like to thank all the collaborators and the institutions that provided the grants uh, for this work. Yeah. Thank you uh, for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. OK, Gurleen, thank you very much for your talk. Um, we're, we're going to have to move on straight on to the next talk okay, to yeah, try to catch up on the timetable. But uh, we have plenty of questions, and we can try to ask some of them during the round table, OK? Sure. Yeah. okay. Could I ask that you stop sharing your screen, please? Great. Very well. Right, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Yong Hang Zhang. Um, he's a professor of electrical engineering at, and the founding director of the Center of Photonics and Innovation at Arizona State University, one of I think, two speakers from Arizona we have today. 
His primary research is on the growth and fabrication of characterization of novel opto optoelectronic materials and devices with focus on narrow cap semiconductors, infrared detectors, and solar cells. His recent work focuses on IR detectors and thin film solar cells for space and also terrestrial applications. His uh, PhD thesis work at the Max Planck Institute for Solid State Research um, was completed in 1991 at the University of Stuttgart. He then worked as an assistant research engineer at the University of California, Santa Barbara, before joining the HRL labs in 93. A few years later, 96, he was appointed as an associate professor at Arizona and became a full professor as of 2000. He's also served as associate dean for research at the IR Fulton Schools of Engineering and is director of the Arizona State Nanofab. He's published uh, a lot, four books, uh, four book chapters, over 300 peer reviewed papers, and almost 20 patents under review or, or issued or pending, uh, with nearly 500 invited talks and almost graduating three, 30 PhD students and supervising 40 postdocs, so very experienced. He's a fellow of the IEEE and the OSA and is a chair of, of both the advisory committees for the International Conference on Molecular Beam Epitaxy and the International North American MBE Conference. Professor Yang, Zhang's talk today is on ultra-thin film solar cell its theory and experimental demonstration. Professor Zhang, the floor is yours and thank you for your time today. Well, thank you uh, for the kind introduction. <clears throat> uh, excellent uh, event. Uh, I enjoyed uh, the previous talks. Uh, they have given a very nice uh, introduction uh, of the background for uh, solar cells uh, so that I can uh, focus on uh, the thin film part of it. Uh, okay, I think everything is fine, it looks like. Um, before I start, of course, I need to acknowledge uh, my collaborators uh, uh, and the students. Uh, they have done most of the uh, uh, hands-on work and also the funding agencies have supported us in the past uh, 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 many uh, decades um, <clears throat> that uh, enabled our research in this uh, particular area. Uh, first, uh, uh, so I skip uh, about all the background. So let's uh, just start uh, uh, from uh, the theory. Uh, probably about- uh, Professor uh, Zhang, could you share your screen? Oh, I thought I did. <laughs> I, my apology, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm talking to myself. Um, okay, great, we can see it. Thank you. Can you see it? Okay, all right, let me move this bars. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. And uh, so everybody see the first slide and the second one, just uh, my ac acknowledgement uh, to, to thank my previous students and postdocs, uh, as well as uh, the funding agencies that they have enabled our work. Okay, so I just start with a, a, a theory. So we developed a, we call it a semi-analytical model uh, for uh, solar cells uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, time flies. Uh, the basic idea of this is that uh, we use um, a simple classical uh, uh, diode model, just introduce a different currents uh, that include a photon current, spontaneous emission uh, current, uh, and shock rid of hole recombination current, OJ recombination current. And also we introduce a, a so-called normalized absorptance and emissivity. Uh, to cut a long story uh, short is that by doing so, uh, we can really uh, model uh, many, uh, many kinds of uh, uh, solar cells uh, integrated as, as uh, multi-junction uh, solar cells. And we also even take into account the difference in reflective, uh, refractive index uh, and OJ coefficients. Anyway, so if you do that and um, the, the calculation time needed uh, is much reduced uh, compared with uh, commercial uh, you know, software package, right, which does uh, uh, purely a numerical calculation uh, and also give us a much better uh, physical insight of uh, solar junctions. So one of the conclusion of this model uh, tells us in a very straightforward way is that um, uh, for practical device, uh, when the material is not ideal, namely you have, say, short-grid recombination uh, centers, 
actually the there is optimal thickness. So what does that mean? That means that if the material quality is not perfect, you want to make your solar cell thinner. And uh, even though that may lose uh, some of the photons, right? Because the thinner absorber, you absorb less than 100%. But because the reduction of the short critical recombination centers, actually you will be better off. So this is an interesting compromise uh, we concluded from this model. So you can see from this curve, so you can you can see this curve tells you where the, the, the peak is. So when the material quality really, really bad, namely the, uh, uh, the short key with the whole recombination current getting higher and higher, and of course the efficiency will get lower and lower, so there will be a uh, an optimum uh, thickness. Okay, typically it goes to a thinner and a thinner. So why this is important? Because this is uh, quite important for thin film uh, such as <clears throat> uh, cadmium telluride, and because it's, it's polycrystalline uh, material, and the material quality is not as good as a single crystal. So this theory has some interesting uh, implication. All right. So now let's move on to the, the theory about the thin film uh, solar cells. So the same model can be used for thin film solar cell. So basically the physics is quite clear. I think uh, uh, quite straightforward, everybody probably knows. So if you get, uh, if you have a conventional solar cell with you know, smooth surface, uh, top and bottom, so the light you know, goes in and out, okay? So ideally you want to uh, let the light travel, okay? Um, laterally to maximize the absorption uh, inside of the solar cell. Okay, well, people call this a light management or light trapping, uh, whichever you prefer. And so basically you want to introduce a scattering mechanism to randomize the light. Okay, there are certain, uh, there is a thermodynamic limit. So the best you can do is so-called a number uh, scattering. Uh, so we uh, studied all, um, all the possible uh, structures we can uh, imagine. So you can introduce a scattering on the top and the bottom, you know, and plus the reflective backside, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you compare all these structures, so clearly uh, D and E and F uh, will offer you the optimal results. So the D and E and F, these, these three, okay. So basically you want to introduce, of course, a scattering uh, as well as a reflective uh, backside uh, to enhance uh, this process. And uh, by uh, doing so, you only need to have very thin layer. You can uh, reach a very high efficiency. So we use Gardner-Massa as an example. For instance, you only need to uh, have about a 0.2 micron. You can achieve uh, over 30% efficiency. And so, uh, so this is a the uh, theory, uh, theoretical prediction. And we also tried uh, some experimental um, demonstration uh, uh, for this. Uh, okay, similarly that uh, when the material quality is not good, then you want to use a thinner uh, layer as well. And that's another uh, conclusion already I mentioned before. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so this is a structure we uh, used uh, quite a few years ago. And so basically we, uh, we try to demonstrate the feasibility. For instance, for this particular solar cell design, we have a absorber thickness only uh, about 270 nanometer. Okay, at that time, that was the thinnest the garden mass I solar cell ever demonstrated. And so we introduce uh, the roughness uh, on the surface uh, of our architectural growth using uh, aluminum indium phosphide, which is transparent. So we can use MOCVD to control the roughness. So this is just uh, for demonstration purpose. Then we remove the substrate, we do the flip chip. So we got a device. And this is uh, the process flow. We start a wafer growth. You know, the, the, we intentionally control the growth process to make the top surface very rough. You see this uh, actually beautiful epitaxial grown uh, pyramids. And then we make contacts. We use a point contact to minimize the uh, uh, recombination near the contacts uh, as presented uh, by the previous speaker. Uh, then we uh, deposit a mirror to make it highly reflective. 
then we flip chip mount onto a silicon carrier and remove the substrate <clears throat> and make uh, the back contact. Okay, but now of course here is it becomes top contact facing the sun. <clears throat> so after the process, uh, we demonstrated quite high uh, uh, efficiency and of course uh, VOC, um, it, it's over one volt and efficiency um, just for this uh, uh, 270 nanometer or 300 nanometer thick solar cell, we have already a, a achieved almost 21%. Uh, percent. And so at a time, uh, I think it was published in 2014. Uh, at that time, what was the record? I'm not very sure if it's still record or not for such a thing film. So as a comparison, uh, we are using the same uh, wafer and we process uh, a uh, you know, conventional dynamizer solar cell uh, based on our university process. Uh, we achieve a 22.6 percent, almost 23, uh, which is not very, uh, very bad. Uh, it's not bad at all um, using our uh, university uh, processing capability. Um, anyway, um, so here are some uh, more detailed uh, device uh, uh, parameters. Um, and so, but today's uh, focus probably is on cadmium telluride. I just move on to uh, cadmium te uh, telluride quickly. Oh, here is the EQE of this guiding mass of thin film solar cell and compared with one micron thick cell. Um, so you can see uh, we do gain uh, quite a bit uh, for the short wavelength uh, end. Uh, that's understandable because uh, the carrier extraction uh, becomes much more efficient for a thin film. Uh, but uh, we do uh, lose uh, some of the long wavelengths uh, photons because of the uh, light trapping mechanism, the scattering uh, by using only one uh, surface is not sufficient uh, enough. Uh, our theory already predict that. So anyway, this all, uh, this all, these are all the expected results. <clears throat> okay, so, I switched the gear a little bit to a uh, kind of intelligent thin film solar cell uh, because this is thin film solar cell is uh, on the market. It's occupy um, uh, more than 50% of the total thin film uh, PV market. Uh, of course, thin film PV uh, market is uh, much smaller compared with the uh, silicon, but it offers a certain uniqueness uh, such as a building integrated uh, PV. Uh, clearly thin film uh, offers uh, substantial advantages over uh, silicon uh, solar cells. Uh, first, solar is, is uh, the largest players in the thin film uh, field, and it occupies 95% uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, of the market share for this kind of telluride uh, thin film uh, PV. And uh, actually, it occupies 40% of the US PV market, uh, which is quite um, interesting and not everybody knows. Um, now, cadmium kind of telluride, I think, from a uh, solar cell um, has the following uh, records. And uh, for um, using the uh, polycrystalline, I think, from first solar demonstrated over 22% uh, percent, uh, efficiency, uh, which is really, really good. And uh, for um, so for the single crystal kind of telluride, and we have the record uh, demonstrated 2016. So we demonstrated a VOC over 1.09 volt and efficiency actually over 17%. Uh, so that's the current status of the art. Um, so now here's a, a short uh, history about the thin film. You can see the efficiency improved uh, quite uh, dramatically. Uh, in the past uh, 10 years, uh, mainly contributed by uh, first uh, solar, and they are still the uh, world record holder uh, in terms of efficiency. Okay, so you can see. So, so we are quite optimistic that they probably can still do uh, uh, better in the next uh, years to come. Uh, we don't see the, the curve saturate, uh, saturates uh, uh, yet. So that's um, some good news for this community. <clears throat> Now, uh, in the following slides, I would just want to uh, share with you uh, how we achieve such high VOC. And uh, 
So we call this a so-called remote junction uh, concept, but in silicon solo cell, they have different names uh, because I come from a three, five like compound semiconductor uh, uh, area. So we use this kind of a barriers uh, all the time for uh, lasers, uh, LEDs or uh, fo uh, photo detectors. So, and so basically uh, when you introduce uh, a, a, a barrier layer, we call this barrier layer, and as the previous speaker uh, discussed that, so then this interface uh, is um, uh, very well protected. So please keep in mind, our barrier layer is lead as matched and is different from a silicon solar cells. So our barrier layer is, is lead as matched. So this interface, you can consider as a perfect interface. There's no broken bonds and no uh, uh, defects. And our, our, uh, our time result measurements uh, of uh, over uh, a dozen samples uh, prove that. And uh, so due to time constraints, I may not be able to um, dis discuss those details here. But anyway, so you can see uh, using this one, so we can really confine the photo generated carriers within absorber and they will not see the, the poor quality contact materials or contact inter, uh, uh, interface uh, here. So that give us a, a extremely high VOC. It's a, as close to 1.1 uh, volt. And so you can see uh, this aerial uh, certified results uh, published in 2016 uh, uh, Nature Energy. Uh, we have achieved, uh, uh, at that time was a 17%. And this is a device we uh, demonstrated a, a, a few months uh, later. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the device we published in that paper uh, is a 17.1. And so if you just use active uh, area, uh, you can get a 19.7. So after afterwards, we have improved efficiency a, a little bit. Uh, we didn't really uh, publish that uh, because it's not a substantial uh, increase. Anyway, so you can see uh, this loss analysis uh, because the light com uh, comes from uh, the top, okay, and, and the top we use amorphous uh, silicon, uh, p-type uh, as the p-contact, okay. So that uh, absorbs light, okay, and um, so therefore uh, we we have a certain uh, uh, you know the p-contact uh, loss uh, in this particular design, and I forgot to mention that one of the uh, novel feature of this is that. So typically for solar cell PV, people introduce PN junction inside absorber. And uh, because as you know, that cadmium telluride is very difficult uh, to be doped P-type. And so by using this so-called remote junction, so we can uh, move the P-type doping uh, outside of the absorber. Okay, for instance, in this particular case, so this is an absorber. So the P region is this P-type amorphous silicon. It is a shaded, uh, shaded area. And so you can, you can see this is very interesting. We only need to have electrical uh, field inside of this absorber to drive the electron holes uh, out. And, and, but the, then the doped uh, region can be outside there. So now you can imagine that by using this kind of a, a concept, and uh, so we can really, um, help with many other uh, materials uh, that cannot be easily doped either N or P uh, type. And also by doing so, we can uh, optimize the interfaces within absorber, oh, okay? Because those interfaces are critical uh, to the uh, carrier lifetime. Anyway, so this is the essence of this so-called remote junction and design. And it worked out extremely well for us. And so you can see, uh, you know, compared with the uh, uh, published results, this is the VOC we demonstrated uh, uh, really, high, uh, really high. It's amazing uh, if you look, uh, uh, looking back, this is a straight line. So hopefully we can uh, further improve a little bit uh, in the years uh, to come. So we, we're hoping that we probably can beat 1.15 uh, in, in the future. Okay. So we also using similar structures to uh, demonstrate 1.7 EV and uh, magnesium kind of telluride solar cell. And so this uh, solar cell is ideal for, um, uh, for making tandem 
uh, with a silicon uh, based uh, uh, two junction solar cells. Um, so we use a similar uh, remote junction design and uh, we graded interfaces, uh, but this grading didn't really offer uh, much um, a further improvement. Uh, we just maintain the uh, high performance. Um, so exactly the same uh, idea, we use a uh, silicon and um, the ITO as a contact. So with this uh, structure, we have reached 15.2%, uh, uh, which is uh, very good. I think that's what we need. We need at least a 15% uh, to integrate the silicon so that we can beat uh, the, uh, uh, the record uh, silicon cell uh, efficiency. Okay. Otherwise, uh, then it doesn't really make much sense to have a tandem. Uh, so what we achieved that uh, objective, and you can see the VOC is a 1.13 uh, volt, and we believe that we can further improve uh, the VOC. Uh, so this is uh, the result we already published. And now um, the most recent research uh, in our group focused on, a, we call it a water-based liftoff technology. Uh, for thin film academy terra solo cell. And so what we discovered um, is that uh, magnesium telluride uh, is a water uh, soluble. And if we use that as a sacrificial layer, then you can, uh, because, okay, the magnesium telluride is almost a, a lattice match to cadmium telluride, all right? So now if you grow this structure on top of uh, indium antimonide, which is also lattice matched, and then you can put this uh, whole st structure in, in, in water, and then mag mag magnesium telluride uh, just uh, dissolve in water. It's, it's an amazing uh, process. And uh, clearly the substance is intact, and so is uh, the uh, thin film, okay? So this process clearly is really, uh, uh, enables the reuse of the substrate, right? Because we don't etch the substrate at all. You just need to clean it. Uh, just use water to clean it, then you can uh, use it again uh, for MD. So then of course, using this thin film process, uh, as I described previously, uh, so we, now we put on a, a flexible substrate, so we can make a, a really thin film, a solo cell. So the total thickness of the semiconductor is only out of one micron. Okay, that includes everything. Okay, including the, uh, the barrier layer, and include the, say, like ITO uh, or MOFA silicon. Um, so we have, uh, we have uh, uh, tried uh, two structures, uh, one uh, with a 0.5 micron absorber thickness, and the other is, uh, is a one micron. And so here is a picture of the thin film uh, after the liftoff. So you can see very shiny and uh, smooth is AFM uh, about morphology, okay? So this process now works really well. So if you do X-ray, you can see all the substrate peaks and the, you know, kind of, uh, magnesium telluride, the buffers all gone, right? So only cadmium telluride and the magnesium cadmium telluride remains uh, in this thin film. So it's, it's very cool. And so we published the, uh, the paper uh, earlier uh, this year and uh, in APL about this process. And so the APL picked this uh, as a, a, a feature story, and they publish a story about that in this uh, uh, Sign Light uh, magazine. So it's quite interesting. Uh, so here is optical characterization of the thin film. You can see the, uh, the optical uh, integrity uh, remains after the liftoff. Actually, we see small improvement of PL uh, intensity, uh, which is expected because we have a stronger photon recycling now in the thin film, okay. So anyway, so these are the comparison between uh, two samples. One is before ELO, the liftoff, uh, one is after. So you can see there's some small uh, increase in PL intensity. So this is our uh, most recent device, uh, which hasn't uh, published. So indeed, uh, as we expected, we are able to demonstrate uh, ultra thin film. So this one is a 0.5 micron thickness, uh, kind of material thin film solar cell. And this is our first uh, uh, try. And so the VOC is a little bit lower, uh, about 0.8 uh, volt. 
and the efficiency is close to 10%. Uh, th there's no uh, AR coating on these uh, devices. And so it's really uh, encouraging. So we are confident that in 2022, uh, we're gonna make uh, a much better device than this uh, as the process evolves. All right, so here's a quick summary. I probably don't have to uh, read it. So we, uh, we use this uh, so-called remote junction uh, concept. We demonstrated cadmium telluride uh, or magnesium cadmium telluride solar cells, uh, as well as a, a thin film solar cell using this uh, water-soluble uh, liftoff technology. Okay, thank you uh, for your attention and uh, I'd love to address any questions in the uh, panel session. Professor Zhang, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, we have a few questions, but we'll leave those to the panel session. Is that okay with you? Oh, of course, uh, not yeah. a problem, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, so if I could ask you just to stop sharing your screen, that's great. And we can uh, move straight on to our next speaker. Let me just share my screen here quickly. Right. So let me just hide these bars. Um, so unfortunately, Tushar Sh uh, Shimpi will not be able to join us today. Uh, and so that has put us back more or less on time. So our next speaker is uh, Pedro Salome. Uh, Pedro is a group leader of the Nanofabrication for Optoelectronic Applications group. He received it at INL. He received his diploma in physics engineering and a doctoral degree in the field of applied physics from the University of Aveiro here in Portugal in 2006 and 11 respectively. During his uh, PhD studies, he performed short research stays at the Helmholtz Centrum Berlin in Germany and at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. Between 2011 and 13, he was project manager of an industrial collaboration between the Angstrom Solar Center at Uppsala University, Sweden, and at Corning in the USA. In 2013, he was awarded with a Marie Curie Individual Intra-European Fellowship, an INF, and moved to the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory up north here in Portugal. In 2015, he was hired as a staff researcher by INL, and in 2016, he was awarded by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology, the FCT, with an investigator starting grant to fund this independent group. As of uh, January 2017, he's been promoted to group leader. Pedro is also a guest assistant professor uh, at the Department of Physics of the University of Iowa. So welcome, Pedro. The floor is yours. So thank you, Killian. Um... If you can see exactly, stop sharing. Put it to full screen. I hope that it's working. It is, we can see it perfectly. All right, it's good. So uh, thank you for the introduction. It has been a very interesting session. Um, it will be hard to follow the same level as the other speakers as the talks have been at an excellent level. Um, I'll be talking a bit about uh, how we can use or how was microtechnology has been benefiting silicon and how we can do uh, in order to improve other type of solar cells we actually go have to go to nanotechnology. And most of the results I'll be showing it's are the results of the European H2020 board project called ArcCIGSM. <coughs> With the help of several partners, um, and so actually some of the plots I'll be showing have been already shown by other uh, presenters. Um, I think it's widely known that the price of silicon photovoltaics has been exponentially lowering as the capacity, the production capacity increases. What maybe is not uh, that much well known for the community in general, uh, especially the outside the photovoltaic community. Is actually uh, the industry is not always fabricating the same kind of cells. So there has been the introduction of new uh, silicon solar cell technologies. So until very recently, there was a technology called BSF or um, 
uh, back surface fields made of aluminium that dominated the market. And we are now in a transition period where we have a passivated emitter and rear contact technology, also called PERC, which is now uh, starting to enter uh, into the majority share of the production. And um, also as one of the previous speakers mentioned, there are other technologies appearing and we are trying uh, our best researchers in the industry to um, accelerate that transition because these new technologies are significantly better. Um, and so what is this uh, BSF, aluminium BSF, where BSF stands back surface field technology. So you start with the silicon. Uh, we start with the silicon wafer. Uh, we actually texturize the surface for optical properties. Then we uh, do some doping to create the PN junction. We uh, passivate that uh, with the silicon nitride, which is also an anti-reflective coating. We do the contacts at the front by front side neutralization. Um, and in the back, uh, we have aluminum, which creates a back surface field and it's the other, uh, the other electrode. And this creates a few interface problems. So a few technologies have been appearing like the PERC I was mentioning. So uh, the PERC is passivated emitter and rear contact. What happens in this in comparison to the previous one is that we have now um, a point contact. So um, the, there is a passivation layer or a capping layer um, like the one at, at the front, usually made of silicon nitride. Um, but on top of that, you actually put a, actually a passivation layer made of aluminum oxide um, and you locally dope the contact so that you create the, the back surface field. So this improves a bit the efficiency. There is another version of this, which is the, the one on the right called PERT, which is passivated emitter rear totally diffused, where actually instead of passivation, you actually put um, a back surface field through uh, doping for heavily dope, uh, uh, doping phosphorus, and there you only put uh, the silicon nitride as a picking, uh, capping layer, but still you have uh, contacts uh, in the form of point contacts or line contacts. A mixture of both, uh, which is starting to be uh, talked about, especially in the European industry, is a top con technology that stands for tunnel oxide passivated contact. And here is a mixture of both, where you still have the phosphorus dope, but on top of that, you have a really thin tunneling layer made of silicon oxide that has uh, uh, enough properties uh, to passivate this surface. Um, and then what has been developing uh, these structures, they actually have been patented between the 70s and the 90s, uh, except the, the top con, that's a more recent one. So in terms of laboratory, they, they are known for decades now. What has been improving is uh, how the industry produces these things. So here is a typical image of a PERC device in 2011, and uh, you had huge contacts and the lines look terrible and these kind of things. In 2019, the dimensions are significantly lower. You don't even, even need anymore to, to have uh, a fully covered layer. So the processing has been improving significantly as you improve uh, the capacity. It's a question of lessons learned or learning curves. And uh, what I was mentioning about the, te the technology development, this reflects in the efficiency performance. So silicon, uh, Crystal has been mostly flat in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, there is a technology appearing, which is the, the heterostructures of the HIT. HID. The industry doesn't like that very much because it needs to significantly change their fabrication processes, uh, but still it is gaining some interesting um, due to the fact that its efficiencies are already higher. And so those that technology, instead of having uh, passivation contacts, they have selective contracts to amorphous silicon structures and these kind of things. Um, even though in the lab, there are almost uh, no developments in terms of efficiency, but rather architectures and uh, production technologies. In the industry, that's not true. Uh, the efficiency has been increased, of the champion models has been increasing significantly. So, and this uh, plot, I like it because it actually shows quite this BSF is being translated into the PERC. So PERC has been consistently getting higher efficiencies. Then we have PERC plus, and then another variation of the, of the PERC, uh, which is kind of a PERC actually, but anyway. Um, and uh, in terms of industry, what has been uh, improved has been mostly through passivation 
and that uh, implies changes mostly in the open circuit voltage, so, which is reflected on this part of, of the plot here. So the industry is developing a lot, uh, while the technology uh, in terms of fundamental know-how, know -how, it's kind of stable. Um, and this is quite interesting. So I was hoping to see this plot before. People always show this uh, plot. It seems very, with a lot of points, a lot of lines, but for the people that I've seen for the first time, this is each uh, dot and line corresponds to a solar cell technology. And uh, uh, each point is a world record in a certain year. Um, and so the lines just represent the time evolution. And then the colors are by type of technology, right? So what is interesting is that um, there has been uh, world records for most of the technologies in the, in the last couple of couple of years. So you see their technologies that have been started to record it in the 1970s. Uh, but as time goes up, goes, continues to go, we will see more technologies appearing and the old technology is still going up. So there is still a lot of knowledge being generated. There are interesting technologies, like for instance, the perovskites that are already a bit of extremely high efficiency, these ones over here, I guess. No, this must be a tandem one. Is that perovskite silicon tandem? But, um, and this is interesting in the, related with the previous fact that I presented is that silicon is quite stable, but it has a lot of device architectures. But when we go look at the, at the novel, technologies, they tend, their improvements tend to be based mostly on materials improvement and not architecture improvement. So there are a lot of gains for these new technologies here, or the ones that are still underperforming uh, in terms of introducing device architectures. And we can take some ideas from the silicon technologies that are working the best. And this is exactly where nanotechnology can enter. So, um, I would like to present coprindium gallium selenide solar cells. Uh, usually people call them CIGS solar cells. So they are uh, devices that have two micrometers of CIGS. It's a P-type absorber. And the world record efficiency here is uh, uh, around 23 and a half percent. And as, as the last speaker uh, referred, when you have a uh, solar cell technology and you reduce its thickness, uh, there's, a, there's a problem of the light absorption, but uh, there is the potential to lower the bulk recombination um, and that increases efficiency. So if you manage to uh, tackle the rear interface recombination, which is something that silicon has been struggling uh, with some time and uh, increase the light absorption, these devices not only are much cheaper to produce than these ones, but they have the potential to be higher in performance. And this has to be done with nanotechnology because now we're talking about sub-micrometer uh, uh, layers uh, and also with features that are very, very small. Um, so could we do a PERC kind of solar cell with a passivated emitter and also passivated rear contact uh, in thin film solar cells? We would need to introduce something where the point contacts we did would be distributed about the diffusion length of the carrier. So we'd be talking about one, two um, micrometers pitch between them and in order to cover a significant area uh, like 80 or 90 or 95 or 99%, uh, these features will need to have a size around between 100 to 200 nanometers. So how can we do this in the lab? How can we do this in the industry? And what kind of technology do we need? So for the passivation of these materials, which is something that is commonly not done um, and also uh, second to last presenter also mentioned a lot these values. So you need to do chemical passivation. That means that you have uh, interface of defects that is quite low. Ideally, you also want field effect passivation so that you can repel minority carriers so that there are not losses at, the, at their own interface. You want to introduce light management and still continue to have good contact properties. And on top of this, um, these layers have to survive the rest of the solar cell processing, which in the case of the CIGS means going almost to 600 degrees in a selenium atmosphere, which is quite harsh. So um, how can we dis do this point contact? So uh, here we introduce two different things. We introduce line contacts that can be done by conventional industrial lithography, opt optical lithography. And uh, we will be demonstrating that silicon oxide, like in silicon, 
uh, for CIGS is also a good passivation material. And here we, we even use chemical vapor deposition as large scale uh, industrial technique. So we can do a conventional uh, lithography process where we have the resist, the development, the etching um, and exposure, of course. And uh, we have these lines here, which are the exposed contact and then silicon oxide. But we also wanted to try uh, point contact. In that case, you have to go to much smaller dimensions. And then uh, we need to go to EPIM, which is a, it's the best tool to do nano features, but it takes hours, if not days, of expo exposure. But we ended up with features like these ones. And these dimensions are actually quite small. So these point contacts, in this case, they are separated by two micrometers and they are 150 nanometers in size. This gives us a passivation area of 99%. For the line contacts, there is a compromise because you don't manage to do the lines as small with photolithography. So they are around 1.1 micrometers. And then in order to have a significant passivation area, you have to, to uh, have a distance between them or a pitch around 2.8 micrometers that gives you a passivation area of 60%. So and then afterwards you grab these substrates and you process the solar cells. Um, this is for uh, CIGS with a thickness of 600 nanometers. So following what the previous speaker was also saying that it seems to go to ultra thin. Usually CIGS has a thickness around three micrometers. So that's a significant thickness reduction. If you do a solar cell of this thickness without any special substrate, you get an efficiency around 9% with really low VOC values. And then our contact structure, what is shown is that you significantly increase the performance and the, convert, the, power, the light to power conversion efficiency, mostly by increase of the VOC, demonstrating that the silicon oxide is really passivation, passivating the, uh, the interface. And then we we'll continue to do some tweaking. Um, so just to show you very quickly how much work is needed for this, but uh, we optimize then uh, the passivation layer thickness. This give a further boost in the open circuit voltage. Then we decided to use uh, a, a bit of doping in the CIGS with silver that further increased the, the, the VOC uh, for several reasons or very specific reasons to, to CIGS. And then by again tuning, but this time the passivation area, you, you got to an efficiency of 14.5% for a device, which is around 650 nanometers thickness of the absorber layer and the VOC of 742 millivolts. So to put this in perspective, uh, the CIGS world record uh, with only a selenium is 22.6 with a VOC of 741 millivolts with a band gap of 1.1. Um, and in this work, we managed to have six, 744 millivolts. So uh, the band gap is slightly higher in our case due to the uh, silver doping. Uh, so we still have significant VOC losses, you're represented by the pan cap minus the VOC, but still in terms of absolute values, uh, uh, we are already at a very interesting value that surpasses even the world record. And I should note that this device here is still without anti-reflection and it's still lacking the front passivation. So it's not a really perk device, but actually a PRC device. Um, at this point, you can ask me, oh, Peter, this uh, e-beam lithography, uh, and also the, the optical lithography can be still a bit laboratory. So can you actually upscale this? So a few years ago, we submitted a patent to do this with nano imprint lithography. So nano imprint is a technique that you actually, you literally stamp a nano pattern into any surface. And we did two uh, patterns, one with a, with a nano imprint, another one with an e-beam, and then we just processed the two solar cells and they give exactly the same uh, device performance. So this actually demonstrates that uh, you can do this in a very industrial way. So a nano imprint not only takes only a few seconds for the exposure itself and the other processing is a few minutes. For the e-beam, you can actually take, in some patterns we can take two full days to do a, a full uh, sample size. With a nano imprint, you actually have another advantage is that you can go to flexible substrates. So then we patterned an eight inch uh, steel substrate, which is completely flexible. Um, and this is just some images of the stamp that we use. So in order to do holes, we need to go with pillars. So that is to puncture the, the resist. 
kind of. And then the, the device is not as good as in the uh, rigid substrates. It's, it has, uh, it's around 12%. And it's mostly because it's much harder to uh, process steel substrates. And there's also a few iron diffusion into the semiconductor, which is not ideal. But we did some uh, bending uh, tests. And uh, after 12 bendings, the uh, open circuit voltage is basically the same. And uh, the, the devices, they have a really good feel factor and, and performance in overall, demonstrating that the needle can be used in several substrates to do the passivation um, in this kind of solar cells. So to summarize, uh, silicon technologies have been benefiting for having not only accumulated knowledge, but they have the several uh, architectures available depending on uh, the industrial uh, know-how that people have. Um, other PV technologies should start looking at the same thing as well, how they can introduce new architectures. Um, and uh, we can look at silicon and learn from them, from their 30 or 40 years of know-how. And our, our substrates that include passivation are working quite well with world record values of VOC. Um, what we are working now is into put some uh, light management there. And in one of our techniques where you, we use nanoparticles to create light uh, management or light uh, texturing, uh, we managed to increase the GSC by 20%. So um, uh, just to highlight this nanotechnology thing. Um, and with this, I'd like to thank again uh, for the invitation to give this talk. My, my team has been essential in this. And you're feeling uh, curious. We, we have a few papers on, on these technologies you can look at and uh, I'll be very open to, to questions. Pedro, wonderful talk. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we'll, we'll move directly to the next speaker. We got a few interesting questions which we can uh, then discuss in the panel, okay? So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Stefan De Luca. Uh, he draws on an extensive 30-year uh, experience uh, background in corporate management, sales and marketing, and product engineering. Uh, Stefan has spent the last 14 years relentlessly, relentlessly pursuing low-cost, simplified solar module manufacturability. In 2006, he was recruited as a turnaround CEO for the publicly traded startup solar thin film manufacturing company Daystar Technologies or DSTI, where he experienced firsthand a massive capital demand for scaling low throughput PV manufacturing. Prior to Daystar, he held multiple positions with Inficon and Leibold Inficon, where he built a new EHS business unit, started up five subsidiaries in Asia while located in Taiwan uh, from 2000, ooh, I mistyped this, up to 2003, I was president of Asia Operations. Stefan holds a PhD in Applied Chemistry and an MSc in Geochemistry from the Colorado School of Mines, an MBA from Syracuse University, and a BA in Chemistry from the University of California, San Diego. He'll be talking today on electric, or the title of his talk is Electrification Without Limitation, the Opportunities in the PV Manufacturing, or in PV Manufacturing. Stefan. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you here. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Killian. Um, let me see if I can get this screen sharing. Okay. So. It's clear, go ahead. It's clear, okay, great. So thank you for uh, the opportunity to, to talk today. Um, first of all, let me say what I'm not gonna talk about. I'm not gonna talk about device physics. I'm not gonna talk about material science and I'm not even gonna show an IV curve. What I wanna do is talk about manufacturing uh, solar panels to uh, impact the climate problems that we're having and to become a significant portion of energy generation in the near term. Okay. If you look at uh, various projections of how much solar energy there will be by 2050, remember 2050 is the target to get to net zero. Uh, we, we have a bunch of different organizations that have uh, projected different 
percentages of solar as a percent of the total energy generation. What I'm going to do is use these very conservative low numbers here and talk about uh, energy generation, 20% uh, of energy generation being done by solar in the year 2050. And how do we get to that point? So we have to start with how much energy is there going to uh, be generated in 2050. And if we just look at one particular uh, net zero scenario, it's about 172,000 terawatt hours. Uh, how much solar would we need to do 20%? So that would be roughly, and, and I'm pointing out a number here, about 17 terawatts installed. That's if the average insulation is about five and a half kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak. So depending on where you put this uh, PV, if you put it all in the desert, you need less. If you put it in uh, on, on buildings, you're going to need more. So as we go to more and more electrification processes, less and less of electrification being in utility scale installations, we're going to move up this curve uh, towards lower uh, insulation areas. But let's just start with uh, 17 uh, terawatts. Right now, we have a little bit less than one terawatt installed in the manufacturing capacity worldwide is about 150 gigawatts per year. So what you're going to see is that we need a massive capacity expansion to meet that 17, even that 17 terawatts, okay? So let me throw these numbers out. There, there's different ways to get there. Uh, what people usually like to talk about is a constant growth rate model. So what I've shown is a constant growth rate of 8.75%. We, we end up at, um, in, in this case, we would end up at 17 terawatts using this, this purple line here with constant growth. But you can see what we would have to do is add uh, by, by the out years, we're adding about one and a half terawatts per year of added solar being installed every year. That's a huge amount going on. There's another way to, to get to the same 17 terawatts, and that is to use an accelerated growth model where we increase very rapidly rather than taking our time to increase. We increase the uh, manufacturing capacity of solar panels quickly. We max out at about 800 uh, gigawatts per year rather than having to do about 1500 gigawatts per year. And, and we, get there, we get there sooner. We have a better impact on, um, on the CO2 problem that we have. And um, I, I threw in this number, right now we have about 3.8 million jobs worldwide in solar. If we go down the path of accelerated growth, we would get uh, on the order of 20 million jobs just to produce 17 terawatt. Um, the, the problem with scaling up to 17 terawatts is how do we scale silicon, right? So it's a very complicated value chain. We've got five factories we have to build to make a module. Uh, those factories uh, take a long time. They take a long time to pay back the energy uh, to make those cells. And right now, the, it, it takes a very high capital cost to build that capacity. We're very geographically focused. Most of the solar panels in the world are made in, in China. Uh, we have a very highly fragmented value chain. Again, there's five different factories that have to be built. And again, a lot of the emerging applications aren't really suited for rigid form factors. Another problem that we have with silicon are, are the economics of this. So we've seen several pictures of the price continuing to go down. One of the reasons the prices have gone down, one obviously has to do with scale, but the other has to do with massive incentives. Uh, and if, if you doubt that massive incentives are required, look at the profitability of solar companies. You can see that this is not really a healthy industry when you have companies losing money every time you wanna, um, every time you wanna increase capacity. And even though if you look at the curves, it looks like the solar prices are going to go down forever. If you look at one of the largest silicon companies in the world, Canadian Solar, is saying, you know what, we can't continue to do this. And actually, since 2019, you've been hearing CEOs of these major silicon companies saying we cannot continue to, to keep dropping our prices. The reason is we're losing money. So if you want to scale up, to these, have these massive scale-ups, you need to have capital to build that capacity and you're not gonna do it when you have this type of profitability in the industry, okay? So the other thing is it's even worse than what we've just talked about, right? So if you take the 
17 terawatts uh, that we said, remember this number down here at about five and a half kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak. That's, that's based on nameplate capacity. So when you buy a solar panel, you buy it based on a flash test efficiency. When you look at the details of a uh, spec sheet from a supplier, you'll see that the what's called the normal module operating temperatures, when you put these modules out in the field, you don't get the nameplate efficiency, you get about 25% less. And if you can go to any of the large uh, module suppliers, whether it's um, of silicon or even CAD tell, you'll see a, a significant drop in operating uh, when you get to operating. So this 17 terawatts really ends up being more like 23 terawatts that has to be installed. So you have to grow even faster and you still have this problem of scaling up that silicon technology. There's, a, there's an alternative uh, technology of perovskites. I'm sure you've heard a lot about the, the um, again, the material science and, and physics of these devices. One of the real keys of this technology is it's extremely low capital cost to, to build capacity up, right? So it's more than an order of magnitude less than uh, the, the CapEx to build silicon factories. Uh, the cost to manufacture can be extremely low. You can sell for less than 20 cents a watt and still make money doing it. You can build factories around the world. Uh, you have a very simple value chain. You can have one single factory building a uh, product from start to finish. And uh, again, you can make these uh, flexible form factors. Um, sorry. How do you do that? Uh, one approach for manufacturing perovskite solar panels is to use high-speed roll-to-roll manufacturing. And one of the keys to roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing is that it is high speed. The other one is that you have to make all of the layers at the same high speed. So if you develop a process like this, where you see all these layers that are getting, including the transparent conductors are being put down at high speed, you have the potential to, to make perovskite at, again, at an, more than an order of magnitude less manufact, uh, CapEx, right? So 25 million per gigawatt versus $400 million per gigawatt for silicon. That's, that's to build the factories, right? If you look, um, I showed this cartoon before, this is actually a real manufacturing line. It's an eight station manufacturing line that we did our, our modeling on. And um, that, that particular line the cost of that building that line greenfield in a new building with a back end is where we get this, this 100 million from. So these are real numbers to build these real factories. Okay. The other uh, advantage you get with perovskite is you know, fairly recently, uh, there are some papers that have been published showing that the temperature coefficient is quite different than, than silicon or even CAD tell. It's much lower so that you, you're the amount of increase in capacity that you need is much lower than the increase in capacity you need for silicon to get to the same amount of energy generation, right? So you can actually make fewer silicon panels, I'm sorry, fewer perovskite panels to get the same energy generation than you would get from a, uh, a silicon panel, right? So we, I know there's, a, there's this sort of focus on uh, nameplate efficiency and increasing the efficiency. And everybody loves to show the record efficiency levels, but what's really critical is how your module operates in the field once you put it outside. And, and so there's a lot more than just the nameplate efficiency evolved there. Okay, if you look at, um, I, sh I showed this curve for accelerated growth, getting up to about 800 uh, gigawatts a year of installation. If we, if we did that with just silicon, if we followed this growth curve with silicon, this green line shows you what the CapEx spend would be. So if you integrate under that curve, it'll tell you the total amount you'd have to spend. With perovskites, if, if we start manufacturing in about 2026, this is the perovskite curve. This is the CapEx you would have to spend for perovskites versus the CapEx you'd have to spend for silicon going forward to reach that same goal. Okay, so again, economically, this makes sense. Economically, you can sell your product lower than 20 cents a watt and make money doing it. Um, you can 
make lightweight product. You have all these other um, factors with lightweight products and flexible products and so on that have been talked about here, but you can really focus on, um, on, on low cost and low CapEx manufacturing here. Again, this is a, a real factory that, that makes this, and I'm gonna show you a couple of quick videos here. In, in this video, uh, we are printing perovskite. Uh, what you'll see here is a web moving as soon as I start the video. This is the ink is actually on this part of the web. It hasn't dried yet, so it's still sort of yellowish. When you get up here, you see the perovskite color and you see a very sharp line here of where it turns from wet to, to dry ink. So you'll see, um, he's gonna put a little marker on there and you see it going by, okay. So that's, that one, I also wanna show you, uh, again, this, these are real industrial tools here. We are actually printing on flexible glass. We're making perovskites on flexible glass here. And in that same tool, you can see, in this case, we're just printing test patterns on, on glass. You see it going by here. Um, another picture as it comes off the web here. So those speeds are 30 meters a minute. When you're making 30 meters a minute, that um, tool that I showed you back here, that one line produces four gigawatts a year. Okay, so that's the type of scale you get with high speed uh, printing of perovskites and that allows us to get to those, that scale up that we need very quickly, okay? All right, so that's my talk. I think I kept it under 15 minutes. So if anybody has some questions, be happy to answer them. Stefan, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I remember seeing your talk a few months ago at another conference and still excellent. Um, we're keeping the questions to the end for the panel session. Is that okay with you? Okay. Yep, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, great, fantastic. Okay, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Very well, it is my pleasure to welcome Andre Augusto. Uh, he received his PhD in Sustainable Energy Systems in 2013 here from the University of Lisbon. Uh, and this was a collaboration work with uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or more widely known as MIT. Uh, during his PhD, he developed a new CVD process to grow curveless solar grade silicon ribbons from a gas phase. And he studied the defects and thermal induced stresses in crystalline silicon at the MIT Photovoltaic Research Lab. He also worked extensively in building physics and net zero energy buildings. As a, uh, currently or today, he is an associate research scientist at the School of Electrical, Computer and Energy Engineering at Arizona State University, ASU, and it heads the, um, the silicon heat reduction research at ASU, at the ASU Solar Power Laboratory. He leads multiple projects related with silicon soil cells, module reliability, PV systems, and sustainability. He experimentally demonstrated a silicon device with an open circuit voltage over, uh, over 760 millivolts and a band gap offset below 0.35 volts. Nowadays, he explores new ways to advance silicon-based solar cells, for example, using thinner and flexible silicon substrates. His vision is to expand the realm of PV and other energy technologies, making them more adaptable and resilient, helping to promote sustainability and energy equity. Andre is also an industry liaison of PV Foundry, a, a project led by the ASU in collaboration with Georgia Tech and funded by the US De Department of Energy to support PV manufacturing in the US. Yeah, uh, Andre, welcome. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, Killing. Long time no see. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, everyone can see my screen. Yes, perfectly. Go ahead. All right. So first of all, I want to thank all the speakers before because they did uh, excellent work introducing most of the things I'm going to talk today. I was a bit afraid that people will not follow the, my talk, but with those excellent presentations, actually, they make my life easier. Um, so I work at ASU. Um, oops, just a moment. Okay, I work at ASU. This is the place I work. That is the solar power lab, and uh, at solar power lab we have the capability to go from wafer to module, 
and uh, manufacturing solar cells up to over 22% efficiency. Uh, these silicon solar cells with high efficiency are the silicon nitro junctions. Some of the previous speakers already talked about the silicon nitro junctions and the passivated contact solar cells. So today my talk will be on these kind of cells, but thinner than normally industry is using today. So why we are here and why this is important, uh, the, the solar energy. Uh, this is an old plot from 2016 that was in a conference that I was attending. And here are different scenarios for the CO2 emissions according with economical growth. And uh, according with, the, with one of the speakers that works at MIT, this is the kind of challenge we are looking. We need 80% reduction of CO2. And so we have to do much better than we are doing today. And for that, we need uh, what he called the technology enablers. So a short of a, a outlook, what is going on on renewables? There are reasons for us to be optimistic. So by 2025, uh, PV will be the least costly uh, form of energy to add electricity. And uh, 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 renewables in 2025 will be 90% of that increase in electricity capacity. Moreover, the renewables will become the largest source of electricity to surpass coal in 2025. So uh, it seems that we are in the right path and we, we are achieving the goals that we've, that we have committed a few years ago. However, there are some challenge. One of them is that renewables are still 10% of the primary energy. So not just electricity, but all kind of energy. And solar is less than 1.5% of that primary energy. Moreover, as the previous speaker and other speakers talked, the level of investment we need to support this energy transformation uh, requires about, this is numbers from IRENA, about $22.5 trillion. And I know that many people in Europe are not aware, but this is a huge number. And to compare that huge number, and I think the Americans will understand better, the US infrastructure, infrastructure bill that was hard to pass in the, in the Congress, it was 20 less times this value of 22.5 trillion. So this is a lot of money. So we have to find a way to overcome and get easier to expand the production of PV. And what, some of the things I'm going to talk in this talk will address some of um, options we have to, to solve this problem. First, we need to close the gap cell to module. So basically uh, nowadays we have cells in the laboratory over 26%, but the average model efficiency in the field is around 20%. So we need to close this gap of efficiencies. Then we need to manufacture more PV and at affordable cost. And we have to find also new ways to use PV. So we have to find new applications where we can put PV in order to, to overcome this challenge and actually uh, answer to the climate change uh, problem we have. So thin silicon PV can be a solution. Uh, I'm, this is the kind of work we are doing at, uh, at uh, a solar power lab at SU. Uh, so silicon is over, uh, crystalline silicon is over 95% of the market share. So we we thought, well, let's try to see what can we do in this huge market actually to help to solve this problem. So if we go Thinner, uh, thinner, if we use thinner wafers, this means that we can have for the same capex, for the same tools we have, if we can reduce, it, let's say, by half the, the, the thickness of the wafer, we can produce the double of the wafers and the double of the cells by using approximately the same capex. So this is the idea of going thin and helping actually to increase, increase the production without increasing dramatically the capex to produce this new production of silicon solar cells. There is an interesting study by Liu that he, he says that uh, by reducing the wafers to 50 microns thick, 
we can actually reduce the levelized cost of electricity by uh, 5%. But if we still apply other concepts, new modules, concepts, and using these cells, we can actually achieve a capex of less 48% and we can reduce the model cost by 28% and we can decrease the LCOE by 24%. So these are encouraging numbers, but of course there is challenge because when you go thin, uh, there are the cells uh, became more demanding, the cell design and the model design. Uh, other advantage to go thin, it's because we can use uh, these materials that are rigid they become less rigid and we can use in new applications, including BIPV, electrical vehicles, Internet of Things, and other kind of uh, portable applications. So by using TIN, we are answering two, question, two questions here. One, we are reducing the, the capital that we need to produce more PV. And on the other hand, we are opening the market of PV to other applications for silicon PV. Uh, so the S cut wafer thickness has been decreasing slowly, uh, not only because of the cell manufacturer, but also because of the module manufacturer, because you have to change the way that you do things when you go very thin. Even though nowadays is expected the average thickness of a wafer is around 160, 170 microns, and it's expected to reduce to 120 microns. Uh, there are two leading technologies that are using such a thin wafers. One is the silicon heterojunction and the IBC cells that are mostly produced by sun power. And uh, there are uh, Longi that is one of the largest manufacturers of silicon wafers. They have announced 110 micron stick uh, wafers on their research and development facilities. So we are still far from those uh, thin cells, but there are other ways also to produce uh, the, the absorber, not only by the traditional Shor um, Shorkowski, but there are other techniques like epitaxy that people are exploring. So the goal of our research was to not so much to develop the wafer, but to try to understand how can we get a cell structure and a quality of the films that provides when the, the wafers are available, we can apply that cell structure and get the best efficiency we can get and performance from those cells. Uh, regarding thin silicon solar cells, there are some work that have been done. The first, not the first work, but a very good result was from UNS Dublin in 96, where with a pearl, they introduced a 20, 21.5% solar cell. Then Sunu, now Panasonic, uh, with a 98 micron wafer, they deliver a 24.7% solar cell. In France, they, with a 61 micron, they achieve 20.5. In Japan, they, with a 47 micron, they achieve recently 22%. And now at ASU, we, with a 40 microns, we achieve 20.7 with the particularity that our cell was a freestanding cell uh, and was screen printed that normally people avoid screen print printing because it's one of the most challenging steps to uh, when we are manufacturing uh, cells in such a thin wafers. So as I said, we are trying to prepare ourselves for these thin cells and the most, and one of the dominant recombinations is going to be the, the surface. So we have to provide excellent surface passivation in order to uh, enable uh, this kind of thin cells. Here, it, there is a, this is a simulation, um, analytic simulation where we simulate uh, 170 microns and 40 micron stick cells. And the uh, year in this curve is the 170, this curve is the 140. And here we are analyzing what happens with the lifetime of the carriers. And we can see the fundamental is the Auger and radiative. We cannot do much about it except changing the doping of your absorber. Then here is the quality of your absorber, the shock and read hole, and here is the surface. And what we did here is that we simulate the, the lifetime of curves 
for two different thickness with the same uh, the same uh, surface, not the same surface recombination, but the same surface quality that is a bit different. Uh, and this surface is, is this J0, that is the surface saturation current that someone already introduced before, typically is over 100 uh, Fantan amps. If you have a very good solar cell, is about 10, but we are simulating with one because it's the work that we are doing in this, in this project. So we are simulating about 100 times lower than you see in the industry and 10 times lower what we'll see in the best cells that people are delivering today. Uh, and what we can see is that here at the VOC, here is at maximum power point injection level and this is at the VOC injection level. This color here, it's the level of fundamental fraction, meaning that when you are one, you don't have shock and redol or surface, you just have Auger and radiative that they are fundamental recombination. And when you are very dark, means that you are dominated more by the bulk uh, shock and redol, the effects on the bulk or by the effects on the surface. So we can see that at the VOC open circuit voltage, we are mostly dominated by, uh, um, we are mostly dominated by fundamental recombination. And at the maximum power point, that is the point that the cell operates here, you, you see that they are more even. One thing interesting, and that's why I'm stressing here, is that the, the, sorry, the, the surface percentage, it's much higher the recombination for the thin cell, that is this uh, colon here, than for the thick cell. So this means that we have to have a better surface passivation that we have today for our standard thickness solar cells. So this work was, how can we improve this surface passivation? Uh, here, we also, with the same kind of simulation, what we did was uh, normally when people are uh, calculating the maximum, the theoretical limit, they don't take in account the shock and redol they use for a perfect wafer. What we did here was in dash line, there is the perfect wafer, but using different surface qualities. And on the solid lines, it's not a perfect wafer. It's a wafer with 10 milliseconds. That is a wafer that you can find in the high hand industry. And we saw what was the best thickness we could get to get this 29% that is almost close to the theoretical limit for silicon solar cells. So we see that as soon as we introduce the wafer quality, we, ha we have to reduce the wafer thickness in order to get this 29%. And this is about from 40 to 60 microns. Uh, this is very different what was calculated and correctly calculated for the maximal theoretical efficient solar cells because surface recombination was not considered and the uh, recombination due to defects in the bulk was also not considered. So it seems that going thin, as we suspect, uh, will bring uh, advantage for all solar cells. Of course, the here we are using the Lambertian limit, meaning that the current that we will absorb on the thin substrate is not going to be as high as the thicker substrate, but even though due to the gains, due to the recombination, we actually will be better off when we go thin. Uh, for P-type, uh, the, the values are a bit different just because we are considering an industrial bulk. This is a very good solar cell. So this is not what you typically find in industry, one millisecond, but there are works with hydrogenation and, uh, and several thermal uh, uh, treatments that you, today you can achieve one millisecond, but again, this is not industrial, but is the best case scenario for industrial P-type. And here we have the same story that by reducing the thickness, we can actually improve the efficiency of our solar cell. Here, what I did was a normalization of the, of the lifetime with the thickness. And I just wanted, because we have many data that was produced through the, these last five years, and I will, but because the wafers have different thicknesses, I tried to see if there was some correlation. And interestingly, at the VOC, we actually got uh, a very good line. These colors here are the quality of the surface. So meaning that blue, the surface is really good. 
we have about uh, below one fontanem uh, per square centimeter. And if they are yellow, meaning that uh, the surface uh, the surface is not as good as uh, as the blue region. And you can see here what happens is that VOC, if you remember from the previous plot, we are mostly constrained by the fundamental combination. So the, and we are actually at high injection. What does it mean is that the, the variations even in the bulk uh, doping won't affect our results because this is simulation and dots are experimental. So we get actually a very good correlation. But when we go to VMP, actually we have different doping because we don't use the same ingot. This is a five years uh, 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 data. So we use different dopings. And what happens is that the correlation was not so much good at the maximum power point because we are basically operating at 10 to the 15. That is more or less the doping level that we will see in this kind of wafers. Uh, even though we got very good correlation and we are happy that we had a correlation between the simulation and the experimental results. Uh, when we go to the voltage, here we can see that these lines represent the, the same voltage for different thickness, different surface qualities. Again, lower number is better surface quality. And here the color map is the open circuit voltage you will have. And what we have here is, again, the dashed line and the solid line is between we consider the shock and riddle or not. Because that VOC is at high injection, the shock and riddle actually will play a less role. So actually the curves, the dash curves and the solid curves are very alike, uh, very similar. What we have here, this is our baseline recipe for our amorphous silicon. And this is our optimized recipe for our amorphous silicon. And we got a considerable better uh, surface passivation, almost a order of magnitude lower. And what happened with this is that we could move uh, the voltage, uh, we could achieve higher VOCs. So as I said, we had a better surface. So we got like five to 10 times smaller surface saturation current. That is a prefactor of the quality of your surface. And we increase about 10 millivolts our implied VOC. That is the VOC measure before you finish your device by photoconductors. Here is the kind of structure that we use. This is a IPN structure. So it's not the symmetric structure. Actually, it's a, a structure that you will use in your device. Then after you apply the TCO and the metallization, this will give you uh, a heterojunction. Now, when we have different absorbers, it's not very fair to compare. It's not a matter of fairness, but it's not very useful actually to compare different voltage because they have different band gaps. This concept was actually previously introduced, uh, I believe by Professor Zhang. And uh, this is the band gap voltage offset. And, uh, I, uh, and what does it, it kind of balance the, the band gap with the VOC. So normally it's considered a very good device if this balance is below 400, 400 millivolts, 0 0.4 volts. And uh, here we have different technologies that I was looking in the literature for different uh, um, voltage they accomplish and the band gap of those uh, solar cells. Of course, perovskites, there is different uh, 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 flavors for perovskites. But I, I, at that time, I took the one that was stable efficiency and stable voltage. And then, but you have here the efficiency that I consider. So basically what happened here is that when you go thin, you can actually get very low uh, um, band gap vo uh, offset voltage. And we can actually reach uh, band gap voltage. The best one is from thin gallium arsenide. We, are reaching gallium arsenide, we don't exactly reach there, but we are around the same ones of perovskites, about CIGS. So we have, we are actually achieving very good devices. That is the meaning of that. As low we go in this difference means that you are reaching the maximum potential of the device. Uh, and in our work, comparing the previous work we have done with the previous layer, we could actually reduce 
this band gap uh, voltage, this gap between the, the band gap and the VOC by 10 millivolts. Uh, here are a direct comparison. Uh, furthermore, we are using a structure that is thinner, that is textured, so it's more difficult to passivate. Uh, and uh, the, these new results show that we got a much thinner intrinsic amorphous, so we are using half of the thickness we used before for the amorphous to get these high VOCs. And we are accomplished higher VOCs using thinner wafers and a thinner amorphous that will be extremely important when we actually have a device and we need to have a good field factor performing uh, a layer. Uh, the difference on these layers, first we get better uh, lifetimes. Here you can see the lifetime curves. This was our previous recipe and this is our new recipe. Uh, these numbers are the temperature or set point, the temperature of the position, and this is the ratio between silan and hydrogen. Uh, we got similar lifetimes initially with 250 and 275. The difference is that when we went to see the homogeneous over uh, larger wafers, because the idea is to go to industry, we got much better in uniformity with 275, so we chose 275. And then we changed the dilution ratios between silane and hydrogen, and we find the best dilution ratio was for 28%. So this new layer has a new dilution ratio and new temperature of the position. And with that, we get 10 times smaller uh, surface recombination, and we got uh, 10 uh, millivolts higher uh, VOC. Uh, to understand a bit what is the impact of these new amorphous layers, we did the FTIR to understand what was the microstructure uh, fraction. The microstructure fraction or R star indicates the presence of voids and vacancies, the density of your film and the disorder of that film. Normally we want more hydrogen, uh, but hydrogen also brings voids so, and lowers the density of the film. So it's a compromise between having a dense film and hydrogen. And we find that at 275, we had the lower R, and but this, and despite we have a lower concentration of hydrogen, actually we achieved the best efficient, the best lifetime. So that was the film that we choose to proceed nowadays in our, in our lab. Uh, so these cells, uh, we we measured the efficiency of these cells. These cells were screen printed. They were freestanding processed, so they were not attached to any substrate holder. They were like, they were processing six inch wafers. Uh, these are smaller cells, but there were several cells in a six uh, inch wafer. Surprisingly enough, they su survive even uh, spin drying. Uh, they are quite flexible. And we achieved 20.7% without optimization of the front grid or the uh, with the tissue we optimized, but not the front grid itself. So if we are going to remove the the sh the sh uh, the shed uh, the shade percentage of the front grid will have over twenty one percent on these forty micron cells. Uh, we also optimize the the anti reflecting coating uh, because anti reflecting coating we use is ITO because we need lateral conductivity because we have a very poor uh, transport on the morphos lateral transport of the morphos layer. But we actually don't, we can decouple the properties of anterior fatting coating and lateral conductivity. So we start to do hybrid uh, layers on the front using ITO, that is a transparent oxide, and, uh, and the silicon oxide that doesn't absorb much light. So we reduce the parasitic absorption. Uh, with this, we could increase, in fact, the, the current about one millivolt. And then actually we increased about almost two millivolts, but the problem here was that the fill factor uh, was uh, being compromised because we use very thin ITO. So this thin 40 microns ITO needs to be optimized still. Nevertheless, we get close to 21% if we, if we take in account the full cell, but if you remove the grid and recalculate, actually we have over 21% solar cell. So these cells, because they are thin, they are flexible, as you can see here in the picture. This is below 60 microns uh, thick solar cell. This actually was done for a company that, was, that we had a project with. Um, 
and one another factor that actually damage uh, kind of uh, was against us is that our cells, because they have TCO, they are very sensitive to edge recombination. So if we compare two cells with the same lifetimes, with the same implied VOCs, meaning that the starting point is the same, but when we do the device, and we do a device with four square centimeters or 153 square centimeters, we'll see that we lost about seven millivolts just, be, just because of the, the, the size of the cell. So that's why when you look at the record solar cells of heterojunction, they are actually bigger than the record cells of the other cells, including Paul or Topcon. It's because we are very dominated by the edge recombination. Here is some applications of integration. I decided to put some of the work that is done also in Lisbon. This is some of the work I did with Caltech that we actually took these small, small uh, thin cells and diced them in very thin cells to incorporate them in the windows. And then we can have a solar cell grid that, and we can have indoor lighting. You can also apply this kind of cells for power the IoT devices, either indoor or outdoor. Uh, the heterojunctions have potential for indoors because they have a very good uh, shunt resistance. This meaning because when you go for low illuminations, you are not so much dominated by series resistance, but by shunt resistance. And that uh, uh, heterojunctions, because they have amorphous layers, actually behave quite well. So to, to wrap up this, the main takeaway is that we are in the right pathway, increasing the PV, but we need to scale up faster and affordable costs not only with silicon, but with other technologies. So I'm a bit agnostic. I just want to, in terms of the technology, but the technology has to be deliverable and she has to last because nowadays we are looking for 50 years uh, warranties that the, the, the producers are starting to offer. Uh, we have to, uh, going thin, it's a way to, with real uh, wafers, achieve efficiency close to 29%. Uh, and for that, we need very good surface uh, passivation. And we were able to demonstrate close to one, uh, below one fentanyl. This is about 10 times the best sales and 100 times the standard in industry. Uh, and we got very high implied VOCs and we get efficiencies that are for this kind of thickness, quite good efficiency. We still need to work in terms of voltage, resistance, and the uh, pseudo and field factor losses. And for that, we need to improve our TCOs and our metallization. I would like to acknowledge all my colleagues at SU Solar Power Laboratory, at Quest and PV Foundry, and mostly my, the students that just graduated. They did an excellent job, and without their work, this work that I'm presenting today is not here. And most of them, curiosity, are not in PV, but they are in a very close field that is semiconductor industry. And um, I'm good. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please let me know, and I will be here to answer your questions. Good there, uh, Andre. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, we have one hand up, but uh, I think we'll start because given it's a panelist. I think I'll start our quick, quick, quick discussion because we've only got 10 minutes until 5 p.m. local time and everybody's got their responsibilities and no matter how much we like doing this, we need to move on. All right, so I'll share my screen quickly. Uh, what am I sharing? Can you see my shared screen or not? Yes, yeah. you can. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I'll stick to basically only one question. And a lot of people were, well, this is important in PV and it's all to do with cost and the scale up in the future. And also uh, it's something which we didn't talk about, but, you, but it's quite important as well. It's uh, durability of PV. So if we can make uh, PV panels last instead of lasting 20 years, if we can make them last 50 years, it means the rate at which we need to replace them in the future is much lower. So the new panels that we actually manufacture 
go into adding to capacity rather than replacing capacity. So I think that's a, an interesting topic as well for, for those in, in the audience. Now, regarding uh, required investment, um, my eyes water when I see these kind of uh, reports where a company like Intel uh, in the near future will be investing several billion dollars, uh, over $40 billion in the, into their foundries to make microchips. And we're talking about one company here. And I want to, I'd like to hear what the panel has to say is, how can, why doesn't this happen in PV? Is it because we're still not decided on the technology or we have, there's a large uncertainty? Is there, uh, are people or investors, and even those who bet on the, or try to sell technology, know that maybe something better is around the corner. So we, can, we can't be doing these big investments and then be risked by, being overtaken by something else uh, that comes afterwards. So, so it's the value added there, right? Sorry, so that, that value added, right? So if you take a chip, you take a yeah three hundred millimeter, four hundred millimeter wafer. The value of that wafer is four hundred thousand dollars. Sorry, a hundred thousand dollars plus, right? Yeah. So you take that same silicon, that that same size of silicon area for a PV plant. What's the value of that? Cents, right? Yeah, so that's, exactly. That's the difference. You get, you can invest forty-four billion because you're going to get paid back. If you invest that much in a in a PV plant, in a silicon PV plant, you saw the economics. Yeah, They're not very good, right? So mm -hmm. that's to me, that's the fundamental issue. Yeah, so, uh, that's a so, comparison of a microchip to to a PV. So it's a, it's a completely different ball game in terms of uh, return on investment with the added value there. I, I agree. It's just a matter of margins, and mm -hmm. uh, the the problem of PV industry has been margins forever, and will continue to be margins. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to attract investment. And I talk with many people on the sector of the wafering, and uh, margins are are really low. So it's when there is margins, and uh, so it's it will be always a challenge there. So, and, and what are the margins? What are the margins? Through. What are the margins like in the in the semiconducting industry? To give confidence to investors. Yeah, it depends it, what part of the industry you're in. So, um, yeah, you know, there again, that's it's very fragmented. So you have you have people making silicon, you have people doing the, you know, the front end, the patterning, and so on. That you know, there's a lot of basically it's yes. all patterning right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh the tsmc's and umc's those kinds of guys and then you have the back end guys who are packaging and making chips and then you have the the guys who design the chip so it really depends on what part of that but their their um their margins are very good they're, mm -hmm. they're not work they're not working on you know eight nine percent gross margins they're they're probably not, probably more in the 50 percent range Okay, okay. So, uh, what we have to do in the PV industry to, I guess, has to be policy driven, doesn't it? To, to guarantee return on investment. So, for anybody investing in, in a technology, you can't expect them to risk large sums of money and then go bankrupt if it's not the right technology. Yeah. That's true. It always has to be policy driven and I would like to add an essential point here. So silicon is an established technology with over 50 years of uh, hardcore experience of experts and market validity. Whereas the graph where you're showing periviscites, periviscite is only a 10 year old technology with stability still, uh, 25 years uh, stability still predicted, whereas we are not even able to put out a uh, hundred day stable periviscite module. So a lot of that will be policy driven, but we also have to show results if we want to raise capital from the market uh, as far as this thing is concerned. Okay. Um, I think I'll throw in another question just uh, which is always asked and the three minutes we have left is stability. Uh, Stefan, um, what do you know about 
prospects of stability for perovskite devices in the future? Because I hear silicon is betting on 50 years. I mean, yeah. I've been right. working with people and they're talking, we have to aim for 50 or 60 years. Yeah, so that's because silicon isn't financially viable. So the only <laughs> way to make it so is to make it last 50 years, right? So it's a bit yeah. of a red herring and it's, you know, so you can argue, yeah, we, we want to have 50 years because we need to get the payback. We need mm -hmm. to get the L. If we're going to calculate an LCOE, if we divide by 50, it, the number looks better. Yeah. Right. So we can sell them for more. Yeah. So that's a, that's a possibility. Uh, the other the other thing that's happening in the real world, though, is you know after 10 years, companies are going out and reglassing installations of silicon cells. Right. So they're doing that for a couple of reasons. One is because other things happen. And you know, the modules degrade uh, for for other reasons than just what's happening to the silicon itself. But yep. the other piece is really about the progress of the industry. So as as silicon panels get more efficient, it makes at some point it makes sense to just go and replace all those silicon panels, right? So you don't have to replace the balance of system. You have to replace. You can replace the panels, and you'll get more energy out of that same area. And you're selling energy. Right, that's the critical part. So if you can sell more energy in the same area, you're going to reglass your panels, your your installation there. So mm -hmm. this the concept of 50 years is what they're telling you is we can't increase the performance of our product anymore, right? For the next 50 years, you're, whatever we make today is what you're going to have 50 years from now. That's a really bad idea, I think. Yeah. Okay, interesting, interesting point of view. Okay. Right, uh, and the last question here, which is compared with other Proskite cell technologies, um, how does how does the oh, I can't remember. Who, I think this is for Gufran. Right? Is he still here? Can't see him in my yes, window. Yes, I am. Yes, I am here. Yeah, Gufran. Okay, so if it, this was, I have a good news, uh, but uh, at the same time, an interesting kind of case. So the thing is. Uh, uh, we also uh, filed like a patent application uh, for the recycling of this special kind of, you know, uh, device design. However, an interesting fact occurred that is, for example, if we even get a patent kind of, you know, for this uh, uh, recycling uh, kind of, you know, procedure. But the thing is, if the panel is there like for 20 years or let's say 25 years, so this recycling kind of, you know, thing itself like you know this patent whatever you are trying to do uh, will become like like invalid yeah. you know so this is like one of the interesting fact kind of you know that you have to think about it oh, that's an interesting one and you can't keep a secret for 20 years either can you exactly so the thing <laughs> otherwise like uh, you know it is possible to recycle uh, you know uh, this technology and even you can see that uh, some very interesting articles are about that how you can take out like all these metal electrodes and even like the lead from from okay. from it. so that so, is the so so I think the take home note is if you want to get rich don't invest your time in recycling because you can't pay people. <laughs> and you can maybe I, I told like time. very very good thing in that <laughs> which okay. nobody is uh, you know at all the right. moment considering okay uh, just but I think I would just Kilian I would just like sure. another side to the recycling. I think one of the most essential things here um, is that that we have limited resources. For instance, most of the cells that we're using use lead, ITO, um, and uh, other uh, rare earth metals. And if we are going to make sure that we have silicon panels, or even periviscite, or other such kinds of technologies beyond 50 years, uh, we need to make sure that we recycle. And no, but I I want to I want to comment one more for one more thing. Yeah. There are many companies, for example, uh, if I'm not uh, wrong, within Europe that gone like bankrupt and their panels are still installed on the roof. OK, so then kind of who will take care of it? So this is, is still we are yes. talking about the most established and like kind of, you know, uh, technology. So so you can you can have a sense that. Uh, how this new technology based kind of installation but there was also another uh, a very interesting study that even if the life cycle or like the the warranty is around 10 years uh, 
Yeah. That is still viable. Uh, I think it is from like, you know, MIT group. I forgot. Yes. Exactly. Uh, it, is, they, it is by uh, Tonio Buonassi's group, MIT. Maybe I, if I remember yes. correctly. So, so uh, the reason I'm mentioning this is like there are companies in Europe. And in fact, I also had a startup working on maintenance for solar equipment in India, looking at this issue. But then the kind of infrastructure investment required for recycling, I agree, is a lot. But there is no other way around. So we have to make sure that uh, we go for a circular economy. And companies which are developing these panels should find a way to take these materials and recycle them back. And that would be the most uh, sustainable way uh, and eco-friendly way going forward. Otherwise, it will be very difficult uh, for us to use, reuse, and, you know, and continue on uh, with this journey for more than 50 years, because we will be out of resources otherwise. Okay. Thanks, Kirlin. Uh, right, our time is up. So if anybody has one last comment they'd like to make. Uh, or... I just have one. And yes, because I, I'm working with many of the people that just don't do sell, they also do modules and systems and their life problems is very different from ours because for themselves, they don't care which cells they have there. And one of the things I found that everyone talks about recycling that I really support and I really want to go forward is actually the manpower you need and the cost of actually doing this stuff that we say, even replacing modules, everyone says it's 10 years, I'm going to replace a gigawatt uh, installation or a uh, 200 megawatts. I don't know if there is someone that is willing to put money on that because it's really expensive. And then you have the issues of warranty to reuse the BOS and everything else. So it's not as simple as in the paper that we say the module costs X. So I can use four modules along 40 years to replace one module that lasts 40 years. That is not a straight line like that because you have warranties, we have people that we have to hire, and then we have installations. We have over 2 billion models in the world nowadays. So it's not, it's not so linear as doing Excel approach to this problem. So I think, of course, we sell manufacturing, sell developers. We love to do these uh, calculations, but actually when you start to talk with uh, uh, PV owners, PV plant owners, their conversation is far from different what we are talking here. So I think we have also to, and I'm trying to do on my side to hear and listen more of these people that actually the ones putting money on this, what they think about some of these plants. So that is only my comment I had on this. And just last, my, my, my last comment, at the moment, what we know about this installation is mostly either on grounds or maybe like on a kind of, you know, roof. But there is an interesting case building up, for example, if they are really the active layers are integrated into the, let's say, glass. And if you try to install them on kind of, you know, as a, as a, as an integrated glass. So then like think about a skyscraper. Okay. So kind of, you know, installing uh, to any high rise kind of skyscraper is a, is a different cost. But even taking it out, like, for example, if even a one module kind of, you know, got uh, you know, like decreased. So from such a special kind of installation, like, you know, it's, 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 it will be extremely challenging. So it's not kind of, so it has a lot of, a lot of uh, kind of, you know, it needs a lot of planning how to, how to do that. Okay. Thank you. Good fun. Um, right. Last orders. I've got no pertinent questions. I, I'm going to thank all the speakers today. Fantastic session, really enjoyed it. Um, we kept the numbers up during the day, I think. We we're about always 70 attendees. So we kept their attention, even with some of the technical difficulties we had. And uh, for those who will be participating tomorrow, uh, see you tomorrow. And I'm sure you're thanking all the speakers we had today. So bye-bye, thanks again. And I hope to see you soon in person somewhere. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everyone.